episode of the Break the Rules live stream. I'm your host, Lev Polyakov, and we are here today for the first time with Adam Green, No More News, and Neil, Gnostic Informant, and we are going to talk about whether Christianity was some kind of a psyop designed to uh, get rid of the uh, Roman Empire. And uh, we are going to start this um, with Adam. And Adam, please, uh, before we start, tell us a little bit about yourself as well. And just to take it piece by piece, I would first want to ask whether you believe that Christianity was in a way designed by Judaism. So let's get it started. And for all the people who are just tuning in, check out Break the Rules. Subscribe, like, click the bell. All of that is extremely important for the growth. I've had Curtis Yarvin on, Jason Giorgiani, a lot of really, really amazing videos, so be sure to check all of them out. Anyway, uh, Adam, you got the floor. Thank you, Lev. I appreciate you for inviting me on and setting this up. I've been wanting to talk to Neil for the longest time. I've been watching his channel since the very beginning, and I've caught you know, almost all of his videos. So uh, I think we have some common ground and he's one of like the few people in the world that can actually like have this conversation like on the intellectually stimulating level that I, that I'd like to have. So I'm really happy to be here and talking about this. Um, you, you kind of, um, what is the headline of the video? Is Christianity an invention to conquer Rome? I would say at the, at a more macro level, like Judaism and the Torah and Yahweh is a religion about conquering the nations. Like it says in Daniel to have dominion over the nations, all flesh will wor worship him. People of all language will worship the God of Israel. Yahweh is a jealous God. He says his name is jealous. And the main objective is to get rid of all the idol worship around the world and ultimately one day have all of the world worship the God of Israel, the God of Zion. So Christianity it was not... Uh, invented to get rid of the Roman Empire. It more theologically conquered the Roman Empire, which is what the whole purpose before Christianity existed, the whole purpose of the Messiah, the Moshiach, the anointed one, the seed of David, was to redeem Israel and then like uh, subdue the nations, have theological conquest over the nations, uh, have the nations put their hope in him, like it says in Isaiah. So that's more of like the the thesis and also it's uh, the, the two main points it's a myth it's prophecy fabricated fake prophecy fulfillment is what uh, the gospels are where they historicize jesus and then the earliest layers of the new testament is paul's epistles and hebrews and first and second peter and it's talking more about a messiah that's from scripture and mystical experiences like revelations or dreams. It's very similar to the Ascension Merkava mysticism. And really it's just like Bible code midrashically connecting different passages. Like you can have the whole Jesus story from Daniel, Isaiah, Psalms, Song, uh, Song of Psalms, Wisdom of Solomon, Zechariah. Song of and, Psalms, uh, Songs of Solomon. Yeah, Wisdom of Solomon and Songs of Solomon. <clears throat> So that's kind of the big picture of where I'm coming from. And I don't want to do too much of like an opening statement and go through everything. I'd rather just kind of go piece by piece w with Neil and uh, get his thoughts on it. Yeah. Neil, any thoughts so far? Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, obviously it technically comes out of Judaism, right? It's, it's fulfilling what's in the old Testament text. It's fulfilling scripture from the prophets, Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel, Daniel, um, and Genesis stuff, you know, all that stuff. However, um, I, here's, let me just give you a little timeline of what I think happened with Christianity. And then I'll want to hear, uh, Adam's response. I think, I mean, we look at, when we look at, so the, the, the tradition says Moses wrote the Torah and the prophets came and then these texts magically got passed down to us that none of that's true. All these texts are mostly written in the Persian period. And then finished in the uh, Hellenistic period, um, and the, the reason why we can prove that is like, for example, the 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 main source of loan words from the Hebrew Bible, obviously Egyptian because they're in Egypt's backyard. But the second highest, which is very surprising, is Persian. Tons of Persian loan words in the Hebrew Bible. So I'll give you an example. The word sukar is in there for sugar. 
sounds like sugar because it's because Persian is an Indo-European language. That's a Persian word. Shoshana is the name of the roses in, in tons of different texts in Hebrew. That's a Persian word. Shushan is the capital of the Persian Empire. It's named the Rose City, basically. And then even slang words like Ashkara, which is like the way, you know, we will say like, um, you, uh, you heard, or what, what, what would you say? Like, for show means like definitely, right? That word, Ashkara, it, me it basically means like, it means like a known thing. It's a slang word that means like for sure. That's found in the Hebrew Bible. And, and the reason why I'm bringing this up, the reason why I'm giving this attention is because there's no Persian as a, as a Indo-European language and Israel, which is Semitic, or, I mean, Hebrew, which is Semitic and Egyptian, which is also not Semitic, but Afro-Asiatic, you would expect to find those two connected and having loan words. But the re for see, finding a bunch of Persian loan words in a supposed ancient Bronze Age text is a red flag. These texts were written in the Persian period, period. All right. Um, so what, why did I bring that up? Because the te it's, it's, they're sort of designing a religion meant for the temple. It's all, design it's, all, it's all based on the temple, the temple laws, what to do on certain holidays, what to do, what the priests are supposed to wear. It's very, it's very national, very nationalistic. Whereas when Christianity comes along in the Hellenistic era, it's more of a global, global, and it's more of like reach out and bring the good news everywhere. And who cares about the temple? We got Jesus. Jesus is the temple. And, but the philosophical undertones start to change a little bit. And I think the reason for that is it's in the, it's in the Hellenistic era. It's during the time of the Romans. It's during a time where Middle Platonism is the dominant philosophy. And so Middle Platonism being basically it's Stoicism plus Platonism, but it also it also incorporates a lot of other philosophies like from the Epicureans. I mean, the Epicureans are very skeptic, but you can see how they're borrowing from the, them the idea of like having mental pleasure over physical pleasure and not fearing death. Just have faith in Jesus. Don't fear death. That's a very Epicurean attitude, the stoic attitude of uh, virtue is the highest good. The need for knowledge or gnosis. You see that from the earliest Christians who they call Gnostics. Uh, living in harmony with divine reason, which is literally the word logos. Living in, in, in you get the, you get the, uh, Neo Pythagoreans do this too. They have the concept of theosis, living with, living one with God. You find all this stuff in, in Greek philosophy in late, um, not, not just with the, not just with the, uh, mystery cults, but in, in like sort of the broader attitude of religious, religions happening in the mediterranean world christianity sort of has that too um and so last thing i want to say um right before the romans became the hegemon of the of the mediterranean there was the ptolemies there was the macedonians under the antigonid dynasty there was the seleucids and those are those are the big three right and um, that's so with Daniel, Adam and I both agree that Daniel's written probably around 160 ish BC. It's not written in 450, it's not written during the time of the Persians, it's backdating itself. There's a million reasons why we can get into that, but that, that's a whole other topic. I know Adam and I agree on this, we talked about this before. It's describing the turn of events that's going to happen with Rome taking over, and and so the reason why I even bring this up, this is important for Christianity because uh. Antiochus III goes to war against Rome. And at that time, the Seleucids had the d naval dominance over the entire Mediterranean. You had Carthage in the west. Rome just defeated Carthage, and they're starting to rise up. The Seleucids are dominating the seas. Tal the Ptolemies are dominating, you know, other things and the like grain and uh, trade and religion. The, the, the Serapis religion was booming. Everybody was part of this, this new, new Serapis religion. It was synchronistic. The same thing we get, we, we, we'll see with later Christianity, very synchronistic religion. Uh, Christ is a lot like Serapis. We can do a lot of comparisons there. But what happens is Antiochus III loses this major war against the Romans, who Romans just conquered the Macedonians, right? Now they just beat Seleucus. And, they, and if you can re if you read like Plutarch, he tells you what happened. They ended up giving all their naval ships over to Rome. They had to 
give up all their lands in Anatolia. Pergamon became a Roman state. Um, uh, Phrygia became a Roman state. Um, Romans importing all these gods from Macedonia and Phrygia and all in Egypt and Syria. And another, another thing, no one talks about this. And this is a big, this is huge for my uh, theory on what, why Christianity exploded. And it's because Antiochus had to give up, and this is what the text says, the sources say 2 million Jewish slaves got relocated from Judea and Alexandria all the way throughout these new Roman occupied lands to work the cities, to become the farmers, to become whatever, just their slaves, right? As a result of that, you have 2 million people going into these cities who are Jews, and many of them are Septuagint type of Hebrews. They're Greek speaking. They are, they're not speaking Hebrew, they're speaking Greek. They're reading the Septuagint, but they're also mingling with these new Greek cities like Ephesus, Corinth, um, Colossae, Macedonia, Thessalonica, all the cities that Paul happens to be writing to, right? Who is Paul writing to? That's the big question. That's, that's where we're, that, that'll give us the answer to this question of this, this whole entire debate. Well, these cities are occupied by Hellenistic Greek speaking Jews who are looking at Stoicism and Platonism and they they like what they see and they're incorporating that stuff. And you get this like sort of before Christianity, like right, from, from 90 BC up until Paul, there's a big movement. And you know, this is not talked about, but it's written a lot about by classicists, people I know. In the academic side, there's this new monism religion called the cult of Theos Hypsistos, God Most High in Greek. It's literally the name of God in the Old Testament, the Septuagint. El Elyon in Hebrew, but in the Septuagint, it's you'll see it's it's like probably 500 times this name has popped up in the Septuagint. Theos Hypsistos, God Most High, and all over Greece, all over Anatolia, even in Thrace, these cults are there. And this is from the period between 90 BC. All the way up until when Christianity starts to rise, and then Christianity replaces it. In fact, Gregory, and I'll, I'll stop at this because I said a lot. Gregory Nazianzus was a hypsisterian, and his parents were too, and they converted. So there's a, there's examples of like early church fathers, like he they call him like the Trinitarian Church Father or something. It's like his nickname. He was a hypsisterian. So all right, I said a lot there, um, but my main point that I want to take that I'm trying to get across is. With the influx of Jewish migrants going into the Roman occupied lands who speak Greek, mixing with the philosophical movements of the time period, Christianity comes out of that. And we and notice how I didn't even bring up Jesus because it's it's pointless. Because Adam and I both dis, uh, both agree on this. Whether there was a guy or not, I think there was a guy who was crucified. But the stories that are written about him are all fabricated myths, meant to fulfill Old Testament prophecies. He's, it's just taking Old Testament themes and applying it to Jesus. The whole That's all four Gospels do this. And not, and I even go farther. It's not just Old Testament. I say they're doing it with Homer, Euripides, Aeschylus, other texts from, from, the, from the broader Mediterranean world because that was what the Jewish mindset was at, at that time. Mm. Uh, uh, Neil, before we go on, uh, just make sure you speak a little bit further away from the mic because I notice your audio is slightly higher. Oh, uh, I can turn than, my mic down. Than, like yeah, or, or, or turn it down a little bit. I, I yeah, tried just, to turn mine up a little bit. Yeah, yeah then uh, I think it's going better? to be... Uh, yeah, I'm just going to turn mine up over here so that uh, you should be uh, good at them. But yeah, my uh, current mm -hmm. question uh, to you, Adam, is do you see Paul as proselytizing primarily for these Hellenized Jews? Or do you see it as being a bigger project that Paul was uh, doing here? Well, if you go by what Paul said, he says he's advancing in Judaism He's extremely zealous for the traditions of his fa fathers. And then he says, God set him apart from his mother's womb and called him by his grace to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. And that's a reference to Jeremiah 1.5 that says, I formed you in the womb. I knew you before you were born. I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So Paul was a Pharisaic Jew who believed in the prophecies of the Torah, that they're meant to be the light unto the nations, and that the, the Gentiles should put their hope into the Messiah and believe in the Messiah, and the Messiah will have dominion and judge them. 
and rule over the nations. Paul even says in Romans 15, 12, according to Isaiah, that Mashiach, the Messiah, will reign over the Gentiles. That's, that's his words. I'll show you that in a second. But Paul thought he was on a prophetic mission, and he wasn't the original, though. So he's the innovator, as far as we know, that became the apostle to the Gentiles and took this to the Gentiles. And it's easy to see how he would have came up with that idea just by reading around the scriptures. He saw from the scriptures and from his visions and, and revelations that it was to be rejected by the chosen people, according to the scriptures, and then go to the Gentiles. So that's the whole plan. He was proselytizing to the Greco-Roman world. He wanted them to, he, he wanted the God of Israel and the Messiah, through the Messiah, to conquer the pagan empire. And in 300 years or so, that, that was accomplished. So he was fulfilling the messianic conspiracy as interpreted by reading the Old Testament, basically. That's, that's the level that it's a conspiracy for uh, the one world religion that is the goal of the end times of Judaism. Neil, do you see this end times conspiracy when you read the Torah? What do you mean by end times conspiracy? Well, uh, how would you describe it, Adam, as far as what yeah. this conspiracy Or the end times involves? agenda. Yeah. The end times script. I, I mean, are you talking about revelation or something from... from from what do you, you talk? What's what's well? Right? There's both. There's the Judaism that only includes the Old Testament and then Talmud and Zohar and other right. things. But the, and then there's Christianity, so they're different. But right, just That's what I'm saying. we're talking Judaism, I think, because Judaism is the parent to Christianity. Sure, sure. I'm, but I, I, I'll even say Zoroastrian is the parent of Judaism. I think it just is just, just always a parent to something else. Um, I agree. Yeah, I agree. I'll yeah. get to that. You, and, you mentioned a couple things. I wrote down notes to respond, but yeah. you can pick up. And you'll right make now. yours just a little bit quieter. I'm just being a perfectionist. Oh, it's over still here. out. Okay, yeah, I turned it down. A little bit quieter. And there we yeah. go. Trying to mog me, bro. There we go. All right. Yeah. So anyway, like I don't know, okay. Neil. What do I think about that? Um, yeah. Well, I I want to. I'll say this. Christianity does have a, a mentality of going out. Not just focusing on like one temple, for example, it does have the evangelical mindset. It is trying to take over. It is trying to convert. It is trying to expand. Um, do I think the earliest Christians that wrote the Gospels and Paul himself? Do I think he expected that? Do I think his? I, I, do I think his goal was to like conquer the world in his lifetime? Probably not. But I think Did he not want. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I but I do think this though. I think there's a component that happens because we're talking centuries that are going by. People are dying and come and, and being born for centuries, and then new generations are coming. But Christianity in the fourth century, late third century, is a totally different entity at that point. It's gone through so many philosophical changes in its doctrines. Um, I think what happens is. It becomes something that someone like let's well, let's go, let's just say Constantine in the time of Constantine, looking at the growth of Christianity, looking at there's a oh, actually let me back let me go before forget Constantine during the Severan dynasty I think we should start there, so Severan period early third century right, uh, the mother of Alexander Severus Caesar Alexander his name is was a was a Christian noblewoman. And why do, I, why do I just bring that up for no reason? Well, it, it highlights that Christians were in high places already. Long before they became the dominant religion in the Roman Empire, they minted coins. The Severans minted coins with Christian scenes on them. Even Old Testament scenes like Noah's Ark. There's a coin of, you can look up, Noah's Ark, Severan coin. It will pop right up. Um, so wh wh where is, I thought they were being persecuted. That's a, that's a made-up myth. They're, they only were persecuted heavy under Diocletian's reign. And then there's some discussion on maybe Nero didn't like them either, but that's he probably was just going after all the Jews and everyone associated with Jews at that point. So in Domitian, maybe. We, we just don't know what was happening in the first century with Christianity. Julian? Jul, Julian. Julian tried, to, Julian tried to restore, and this is, a, this is obviously way later than that, but this Julian tried to restore the for, temple and give it back to the Jews. So he was he had a more balanced approach. I think he just wanted he wanted the Pythagorean system where every city has their own god, where Serapis rules Egypt, Yahweh rules uh rule, and I and I think this is the system that would have been the most made the most sense. Yahweh rules Jerusalem, uh, Athena rules Athens, 
Jupiter rules Rome. Like, you know, every city has their main God. And that, and then you can if only monotheism wasn't so intolerant and was jealous and wanted to, uh, everybody to, to worship him in a one world religion. The Pythagorean order had it figured out. They had it figured out. Just listen to them. Mm-hmm. Anyways, they didn't listen mm-hmm. to them. Um, those, the, the, uh, fundamentalist one, yeah. and this is the world we're in. But, um, I lost my train of well, thought. There, there, there is a fundamental uh, question here, though, as far as whether this was intentional or not on behalf of the, let's say, Jewish leaders who would have developed this Christianity as opposed to a game of telephone that just took on its own energy. And all of a sudden, this thing called Christianity started getting very popular among the Roman nobles, as Neil was talking about. That's the differentiation I'm trying to find out here. So, Adam, what would you say would lead one to believe that it would come from something much more sophisticated and organized let's say on behalf of let's say certain you know uh, mm-hmm. jewish leaders back in those days to create christianity mm-hmm. as this way of conquering rome yeah i don't know i don't know exactly how sophisticated it was or how much details they had planned out i think it was actually an evolving uh developing thing that wasn't you know a monolithic where everybody got together and said this is the plan i think it started off as just a heretical jewish sect that saw this savior figure in the scriptures and in their visions and maybe they thought that the chances were grim that they would ever have a moshiach ben david a politically vic- uh, militarily victorious messiah so instead they thought, uh, like the whole Jesus and Barabbas story is That's an allegory. You were about to say that? No, I, was, I remember what I was going to say now, but go ahead. Oh, okay. It. Yeah, Jesus and Barabbas is all an allegory on how the the Jews should have been going for the suffering Messiah instead of the uh, Barabbas, like the um, insurrectionist, the milita- militaristic one. So they went for a more pacifist, and Christianity was written in Greek. Paul was the one that took it uh, to the Gentiles. And it was to get to, for the Moshiach to conquer the idol worship, to replace the idol worship. And I wanted to show a quick verse of exactly like what Paul had in mind, because he, he, he writes, you can see all the verses that was inspiring for what he did, right? So here, let me just uh, share something please for a minute get sure i, I just want to make sure you're I, able I, yeah i remember what i was going to say while i was looking that up so mm-hmm. i brought up the severan dynasty for a reason because not only are the severans promoting christianity in the east and um sort of giving them you know the the elites christians more power in the patrician world you also have under the severan dynasty um the the uh patronage to give to flavius philostratus to write the life of Apollonius Satiana. And so you get these sort of savior figures, Apollonius Satiana, Jesus of Nazareth, Hermes Trismegistus. All of these stories are getting pushed out during this time period, the Severan period. And so by the time we get to Constantine, a, almost a, a break, basically over a century, a little, probably a century later, they've gotten so, they've risen so high that Constantine can now look at these and say, this is this is actually the religion that actually fits best to run an empire because it gives the slaves and the lowly their power. They'll run, they'll fight the armies for me. They'll they'll work the fields for me as long as they got their god. Everyone's happy. And it really fits like a glove for an empire. But go ahead. It, Christianity's written in Greek. It's not intended for Jews. In Christianity, the Jews are to reject Jesus and not believe in him until the end times. And, and they ha- have stumbled and been hardened and, and you know, th- uh, illusions like this. It was created for the Gentiles, the Great Commission to go out and baptize the nations, the apostles speaking in tongues, meaning speak to all the tongues, uh, uh, the gospel of Jesus, speak to all languages. And... So this is the verse, Romans 15, 12. Isaiah said, there shall be the root of Jesse, that's the Messiah, Jesse's the father of King David, that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles trust. And that's, uh, that's a reference to Isaiah also. To it shall the Gentiles seek. He will raise a banner for the people. So that, that's what Paul writes himself. He also says in 1 Corinthians, Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom of God to the Father as he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. I think that would include the Roman Empire, right? For he must reign until he has put all of his his enemies under his feet. 
That's a reference to Psalms 110. Uh, the Lord says to my Lord, so God says to the Son of Man or to his Son or to the Messiah, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Who were the enemies of the uh, ancient Jerusalemites when they were occupied by Rome before Christianity was started? It was Rome. So who is Jesus ruling over? Rome or who they view as Edom. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. So who were that, their enemies at the time of the creation of Christianity? It was the Romans, and that's to who be clear, now believes in Jesus. To be clear, so who Jesus was is your, ruling over the Romans, the Roman Empire. Who was your to Psalms. In, this, uh, in, in Psalms over here, just so we're clear about that? So when he's saying your sure. enemies, who was he saying this to specifically? Well, if you read Psalm 110, it says, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And in Hebrews, Jesus is identified with Melchizedek. The Lord at... The right hand shall strike through kings in his day of wrath. So the Moshiach is meant to uh, conquer all of the kings of the nations. He shall judge among the heathen. He, and so judging the heathen, the Gentiles, also is the role that the Messiah Jesus did. So it's, Paul, it's, it's, if you look at all the scriptures that they're using to create what Christianity and the Messiah is meant to do, time and time again, it's this type of things. It's about, like, let me show you. And I got a mm. Nietzsche thing I wanted to start with. Zechariah 14.9, it's one of the most uh, end times chapters of the Old Testament. The Lord shall be king over all the earth, and that day there shall be one Lord in his name one. That's the goal. Daniel 7, son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. Jesus is identified as the son of man over a dozen times in the first gospel, Mark. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worshipped him. His dominion is everlasting. That's the goal of the Messiah. That's the goal of Jesus. Ezekiel, the heathen shall know that I am the Lord. Tobit, all nations shall turn and fear the God, true, Lord God truly and shall bury their idols. And then like Psalms 22, another very messianic verse uh, that they cherry pick to create the Jesus narrative. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord and all kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. Sure. Kingdom is the Lord, and he's the governor among the nations. Before uh, before Neil responds, though, I have a quick question here. All mm -hmm. of this, at least to me, does not seem to single out Jews. It seems to more mesh Jews in with all of these masses that uh, the Lord would be uh, heading. And that's the part that I'm not exactly clear about this, because it seems like Jews end up getting a raw deal here. All of a sudden, they're not the chosen people anymore. They're just like one of many of these nations that are going to be under the thumb of Jesus. I don't know. That's at least what it seems like to me. But you tell me the, the context the context here is the nations means the goyim means the non-jewish world and you can see from isaiah 42 49 45 that By the that's, way, they say they, that's the context uh, you when you get the word the that word uh gentile or uh nations when when those sometimes those words get translated into pagans in some text too so mm -hmm. it I, I mean i bring that up because the uh what, what do you think is like the function of this text when it's written? You think it's just like they're, they're holding on to these texts and reading them and like having wet dreams about what, conquering the world? Because we're talking thousands of years have gone by before Israel even gets its own state back. Um, but they and did get it back. They did Mostly get it back. Pag paganism got largely eradicated. Christ uh, Judaism sure. was, it was preserved and persecuted and while they were in exile. And sure. then now... Now they've made their return, and Christianity has made a huge turn and become their their uh, biggest supporters and allies, and yeah. helping them almost the Christian Zionists, Zionists like John Hager, like helping them fulfill their prophecies, basically. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean, I, I'll think of like, like I can like the Sibylline Oracles for Rome have similar mess, not messianic, but like similar promises for the glory of Rome and stuff like that, and you could find like Di Diodorus of Sicily where he talks about how Amon and his son Bacchus will set up a kingdom in Egypt to rule the world from. Um, and then, like, let's say if Egypt would have became the dominant force in the world, then without it, that would have been, like, a fulfilled... Pro I mean, I was saying, are we looking... Do you think... It would have been. Yeah. But that's not what took over the world. It's been, sure. it's been I Judaism and the other Abrahamic religions dominating uh, more than any other thing, really, for 1,700 years. Now, so you do you think because these texts were written and preserved, it sort of people held on to them and 
you know, maybe then not just not this generation, but my kids' generation will be the ones to do it. You think that's what was happening for 15, 18, or 20 centuries, actually? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. interesting well i mean I, I, they, I mean they they pray three times a day for the rebuilding of the temple you know they do you think that sincere believers want their prophecies to be fulfilled and they and that they want to return to the land and they want to uh, have all of the nations grab onto their their tassel and say we heard god is with you like that that's what that's what tovia singer wants right uh c can you go back to the share because i wanted to start with this because i know you're a nietzsche guy sure so i wanted to throw that at you real quick Nietzsche says, quote, just think of who it is that people bow down to today in Rome itself as the personification of all the highest values. And not only in Rome, but in almost half the earth everywhere, people have become merely tame or want to become tame in front of three Jews, as we know, in one Jewess, Jesus of Nazareth, Peter and Paul and the mother of the aforementioned Jesus named Mary. This is very remarkable. Without a doubt, Rome has been conquered genealogy sure. of morals I, I like this passage and i understand what he's getting at because in a sense the the hierarchical structure of let's say soul the soul invictus the last strata of roman religion the mithraic religion of soul invictus and um there's a hierarchy caesar's on top next to caesar are the um what do you call them the uh you know, there's a hierarchy, the, the patricians and the equestrians and the plebeians and the slaves. And that's the sort of system that sort of permeates. Christianity kind of flips that on its head. And Caesar is the devil, 666, Nero. Uh, Jesus, who's just some random Jewish guy, is, is, is actually king and God himself. And the, the last will be first and the first will be last. It's a flipping of all morality. And... It becomes it, 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 and so, sort of like the social justice warrior movements of today. You get all these sort of martyrdom stories of, uh, you know, um, Michael, whatever his name is, Michael. What, what's you know, some, name some of the uh, George name some Floyd. Of, George Floyd. Thank you. I don't know. I couldn't think of any. So George Floyd. You know, or Irenaeus got ate by a lion. It's one of the stories, right? And everybody, everybody like rallies behind these martyrdom stories and sort of looks at this. Roman state as something that needs to be uh, rejected, right, in the, in the Christian sense. But as it permeates through all the lower rent classes and soldiers, a lot of soldiers are Christians, a lot of boat builders are Christians, they're joining, because these people need jobs, they're joining stonemason clubs, you could see, I, there's evidence of that, John Kloppenborg wrote a book about all the evidence that we have of the earliest Christian stone inscriptions that we have their names on what looks like um a, a old ancient uh trade unions like like a union like you know today you find like a union of like electricians but back then you find like inscriptions and they would dig up like these these ancient sites and it's like oh this is a, a bone a boat building union and there's everyone's name is on this list and they're all christians by the way and you have like leather tanners, boat builders, uh, stonemasons, and these are all. This is where all the Christians are getting jobs. So they're spreading all throughout these in these inner cities. There's an inner city religion, and they're sort of being the shepherds of these of this movement are the educated class, the ones who are studying the scriptures, the ones that are studying Plato, studying the pre-Socratics, and. You know, you start the people like Origen, the people like uh, Hippolytus, who are just sitting around in libraries all day and writing up epistles to each other. And so this is sort of like a this this movement grows and grows and grows. And as I said, the Severans really put them on the map because but before the Severans, they were just kind of they were getting beat up real bad by the pagan philosophers like Plotinus and um, and uh, Iamblichus and, and uh, Celsus was destroying them. In his arguments against Christianity, he, if everyone, if every Christian read, read Celsus, a lot of them would could deconvert. That's how good Celsus is. Anyways, long story short, as it grows and as the Severans put them on the map, and as they get through the crisis of the third century, um, by the time you get to Constantine, he's he's looking at this perfect system of like a system of people who are going to work the fields and work and build my boats and run my and and fight in my armies and why do i need all these cults of 
of, of uh, higher class people who are striving to be good, who might con- who might want to take over my government. They, these people have ambitions. I don't want that. I want the people on the bottom who just are happy at being living as a fucking slave all day. That's what I want to rule. And so it fits perfectly. So the reason why I bring that up is because I don't think I disagree with Nietzsche's conclusion. I agree with him on the morals flipping, but I disagree with him. I think Rome conquers Christianity, not Christianity conquers Rome. Constantine saw Christianity for what it was and says, we're going to Romanize this thing. And but, this but was it was what? it was it not the goal of before Christianity? Was it not the goal of in Judaism that the Messiah would conquer Rome? Uh, well, it doesn't really say if it's going to go to Rome and conquer it and become Rome. It's more, more of Rome would be defeated in the war to come, and then the kingdom of heaven is going to come down. That didn't happen, though. So Rome ends up becoming the, the head of Christianity, which I don't think that was ever in the plans. It just, it just happened. It's just, this is the way it ends up. Because I think, I think the, the plan was Rome was supposed to be defeated and gone, and then the Messiah is supposed to r- rule from, from Israel. But the ch- the plans get shifted and it ends up being Constantinople is the head of the church and mm. and 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 that's just the way it is. This is the, the best shot we got. Let's roll with it. Mm. What you can't, I mean, that's just. But, but but I just showed you the verses that Paul cites from Isaiah and Psalms where it clearly says that he's going to rule in the land of their enemies, and that and then the, you know they read from the scriptures that it would be rejected by his people and go to go to the nations. And, well, and Christianity, I, Christianity was intended for the Roman Empire, for the Gentile world. That's why all it's, it's paying to not. Caesar and the centurions that has the best faith. And yeah. it's it's ne- it has negative portrayals uh, of Judaism. I think we should talk about Paul for a few minutes because Paul also says not to get married or have kids because the Messiah is going to be back any day now. He says some of you aren't even going to die. Is that some of you have passed away? I, I get it. They're just sleeping right now. They're 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 gonna, they're gonna see the Messiah too. Don't worry. They're not missing anything out. And he was convinced that Jesus was gonna come back before the end of the first century, or uh, come for the first time, maybe come for the first time, right? Yeah, because he never knew him and only saw he never and talked him. about the post resurrection, uh, uh, yeah, resurrection appearances. But, okay, and then but there's another, you're right. Paul is very schizophrenic in his own sense because he's got that side to him but you're right he it is almost like he is sort of setting up plans because in another aspect when paul is writing to the corinthians he says they're they're really concerned about eating meat sacrificed to idols and because they're you know they're living in this world that's pretty much mostly pagan they're 10 percent of the population i think christians christians and jews together were so 90% pagans, everyone's revered around those pagans. What do we do? Like, how we how are we gonna Moses told us we can't eat meat, sacrifice to idols. And Paul just says, fuck it, just do it. I mean it's, it's in Corinthians. He says, Who cares? I, I, I'm I'm paraphrasing, but if you read Corinthians, you read about look up Paul, meat, sacrifice to idols. He says, It doesn't it, the they don't have uh if your brother can't do it, he can't handle it, don't do it, don't don't do it in front of him. But you you have the you have the gnosis who gives a shit. Eat the meat sacrificed to idols. Who cares? It has no power over you. And this, this, I don't know why I put the number seven. That was weird. And this becomes the, the, um, <laughs> it made no sense. Uh, maybe we don't have free will. I'm just kidding. Uh, no, but this becomes the playbook that the Christian, this becomes doctrine. If, because the Roman imperial cult, their playbook was to go in and, 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 and take over the cities, but import their cults and import their gods and take on their culture. So, for example, when Rome defeats Carthage in 204 or 202 BCE, when Hannibal gets Are, to- are you saying this sounds like uh Roman provenance? Are you saying the Romans created No, it? no, no. I'll, I'll I'll tell you why that's that theory is stupid in a second. Because I agree. Yeah, no. It's not it's the, the Romans didn't create it. They Okay, let me So let me who just- were the original Christians then? Since we agree Paul just innovated and took it to the Gentiles. Who were the original Christians, and why did they invent Jesus? Why did they search the scriptures and, so and I'm believe say, all these things? I'm going to say the original Christians that Paul is writing to in his epistles are a mixture of Greek-speaking Jews and just regular Greeks who are interested in 
theos. But that's who he's talking to, though. Like, who are the original Christians? Do you not believe it's James yeah. and Peter and the Ebionites, the, the Nazarenes, that I'm they could sure have been related to the Qumran and the and the Essenes, the Jerusalem awesome. church, the, the poor awesome. ones, the Ebionites? I think that's where it started. And that's 100% a Jewish movement. Influenced sure. by Hellenism, yes. Did they, and I agree with you, obviously, on the Old Testament, they incorporated all types of Greek, Sumerian, Egyptian, Canaanite God. And then in the New Testament, yes, they did overlay the uh, Davidic Torah Messiah over, you know, different, an amalgamation of different pagan, ri dying, almost, rising, passion gods. Demi hold on, demigods, sons of gods. They just made their Jewish version of it. And then through Paul, targeted the Gentiles in the Greco Roman world. I agree with you on all that. Mm -hmm. The only thing is, we don't, whatever the goals and fantasies of the first century judean rebel let's just say that's what jesus was or if you think jesus didn't exist james whoever somebody existed somebody started this movement it didn't just come out of nowhere whoever that was we have no idea what their goals and fantasies and and what they wished for the, for the world to happen because whatever they're like it's not, you can, i mean this grand narrative of this one monolith all had the same mindset all had the same attitude for 400 years i think it's just un unrealistic i mean i think as generations pass down people have different ideas people branch off you get different different sects of christianity different sects of gnostics different sects of judaism you get rabbinic yeah, christianity started like as a with a lot of diversity of competing sects Absolutely. that's why in peter it says for we did not create cleverly devised stories because and, and paul says that people that are preaching other jesus's right so there was other sects of christianity that probably believed and i think a, a strictly mythological celestial that they were seeing in ascension experiences like paul right. says he's caught up into the third heaven there's the ascension of isaiah story where jesus is crucified in heaven there's the lost book of the ebionites that that uh epiphanius talks about called the ascents of james there's the apocalypse of James where he's having uh, special revelations from Jesus. Doesn't sound like it's his flesh and blood brother, but he knew. I think the only way Paul would have had any influence and the reason that in, that in his epistles he so adamantly insists that he didn't learn any of the gospel of Jesus from any man, that he got it strictly from his visions and from scripture. So the only way that would have any authority and credibility is if the Christians before him also only saw Jesus in scripture and mystical experiences. Well, I mean, I guess if mythicism was true, then I guess that's possible, but I, I just don't know how you get to that. I don't know how, I mean, I'm, I'm just fine with granting the probably was a dude. That's it. Hmm. And I, but, I, but I'm totally with you on, the the texts that get written about him in the gospels are it's a different character it's like it's taking some it's like taking superman and out of uh whoever the actor of superman or whatever it's like a different person it's a different whatever um but I, the reason why i brought up the romans real quick i just want to i want to highlight something of how it, how we can actually make sense of all this it was roman doctrine to adopt the cults of their the of their countries that they're taking over so when we, when we look at, like, for example, they're, they're digging at Herculaneum right now in, in, uh, in Pompeii in Italy, and they just found a giant statue of Attis on a uh, with a crown on his head, a laurel crown, and um, he's sitting on a, uh, on a throne, and, he's, uh, and they, got, they have the great mother, um, Kybele, what they call Magna Mater. This is, all, this is Phrygian religion. That's not Roman. They adopted that from the Phrygians. You wouldn't say the Phrygians conquered Rome, though. Rome conquered the Phrygians. They just adopted their customs and religion. Now, Paul, Paul's attitude of who cares if they sacrifice meat, meat, meat to idols, this is almost like a natural selection thing that happens here because after Christianity sort of becomes the de facto state religion, they start doing this in their country. They start continuing the Roman imperial cult playbook with Paul's teachings added to it. For example, when they go into Gaul and Germany, a lot of these, there's a, there's a letter from, from Pope. I said this in one of my videos. There's a letter from Pope Gregory in the fifth or sixth century. And he's telling the Bishop in London to not destroy the pagan temples, to sprinkle holy water on it, take the idol out, put a cross in there. And then it's, it's clean. It's it's sacred now. Make it a church and let them continue to do their pagan rites 
As long as it's not to one of the demons, as long as it's to Jesus, we're good. So that's the Roman imperial cult playbook, but it's just Christianized. It's still the Romans, dude. It's still the same shit. Yeah, but it's it's Peter who supposedly went and set up the church in Rome. It was Paul who tar targeted Rome, and it was exclusively a Judean sect that was Torah observant before it they innovated it and took it to the Gentiles. Uh, our buddy Myth Vision Podcast in the chat says, does Adam blame Jews for all Abrahamic faiths? I don't blame any Jews today for the Abrahamic faiths because this these all started 1,300 and 2,000 years ago. But it is a fact that this started, this emerged out of Judaism as a Torah messianic sect and that it's mostly mythological. So the question is, why did they do that? What, who invented them and why? And it's clear it started as uh, movements in Judea by Torah observant uh, groups. And they clearly envisioned that this religion should go to the Gentiles. So the, the facts are facts. The prophecies are there beforehand. You can see the way that uh, all the scriptures that led to Christianity, you can see the rabbis as far as a thousand years ago already saying that Christianity and Islam, which also is an Abrahamic faith and believes in, in uh, Jesus, that they are all, uh, Maimonides, the Rambam, a thousand years ago, says that Christianity and Islam are preparing the world for the messianic age. So now it's the rabbis are chanting that they want Moshiach now. They're waiting for the Messiah, the Davidic Messiah, and the Christians are also waiting for a Davidic Messiah. Even the Muslims are, are waiting for a return of Jesus. So it's not my opinion. These are just the facts. And uh, I don't even think he disputes them. Largely well, myth started at... Yeah, I mean, they're all, obviously you're going to find... You can look on the internet. You can find all types of different rabbis with different opinions on what they want to happen in the world. But there's also yeah, I'm talking about the official Orthodox group made a statement about it and the top respected rabbi, the Rambam Maimonides in like all of Judaism said it. It's and then, yes, yeah, they're going to say dozens like, and oh. dozens of rabbis all over the Internet. Almost every rabbi video we watch, that's what they'll say. Well, I mean, that's what my, my point was. They're not really a monolith. You, that group might be. But, you know, they're never claim they're monoliths. In I fact, I think it started as a fringe group and uh, it, uh, it was viewed as heretical. And I think. I think the total Yeshu story a little bit is that they decided, oh, this is a threat to us, so let's change it up, make it more Gentile, make it worshiping a demigod, uh, doing anathemas like drinking blood. It's it's oh, so you, you can see kind of what led to this from the Dead Sea Scrolls. You can see was just like uh, uh, you know preceded Christianity and the way things were going. Mm. You you think it was a scenes that wrote the Gospels, not. Because I'm I not look necessarily. I think the the Essene sects and the Alexandrian diaspora were connected, and that it probably most of it happened over in Alexandria, like you said, Wisdom of Solomon, well, a hugely influential book to Christianity. So I think it had something to do with both of them. Let me. All right, I agree with you on this part. Because mm -hmm. Philo, who's a Middle Platonist, by the way, he's one of the group. There's a book I have it over here somewhere. It's called Middle Platonist. Amazing book. Um, where is it? I don't know what I did with it, but uh, it's called, look up Middle Platonist. And Philo is one of the prime examples that they use for this time period. It's, you know, they, they, the Middle Platonist period. So it's in between regular Platonism and Neoplatonism. 90 BC till Plotinus, which is third century. And Philo is like the, Philo is the prime example of a Jewish ne Middle Platonist who's speaking in Greek, writing in Greek. And he also talks about a group called the Therapeuti, who he compares to the Essenes, who are they're all healers, they're all like these 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 uh, divine healers. They're very pious, very orphic like, um, and he's it's like he's describing. It sounds like he's describing some sort of proto gnostic Christian group without Jesus, um, and that's what I think this is what we're, we're looking at. So I would say I agree with you that whatever the, I agree that the orphic myths inspired some of this. I agree, but yeah. it, it was completely changed at that mm. point. Well, what I was saying, that's what, what was Philo saying, was doing. He was, was saying, esoterically reading the scriptures and Hellenizing it and mixing it with exactly. Yeah. And I, but he and he loves he loved the Essenes. He talks about them. He praises them. He compares them to these therapeutai. So I, that's why I, the reason why I even brought that up was to agree with you that whatever whatever the Essene movement was, um, like for example, in some of the parables, he, there is this is a big point against the Essenes. But I'm going to tell you why it's bad. It's a bad argument. People say Jesus can't be in a scene 
because the Essenes in the Qumran documents in the Dead Sea Scrolls text said that if your animal falls into a ditch on the Sabbath, you can't touch it. You're forbidden. They're very strict. The Essenes are the most strict there is when it comes to the Sabbath. But Jesus says, he literally says, if your animal falls into a ditch on the Sabbath, you're going to go and grab it, right? So the people say, ha, he can't be in a scene. Here's why I think it's a bad argument. Why would he even why would he even formulate that that pat that that statement if he wasn't around the Essenes? He probably wasn't a scene that's debating against themselves. By the way, they're all very Platonic and Aristotelian. Even the rabbinic Jews, if read them, the, read the uh, the um, the Talmud. It's a the Mishnah and Gomorrah going back and forth. It's like a Platonic dialogue. The whole text is basically a Platonic dialogue. But so Jesus probably was someone from this movement coming out of this movement and disagreeing with that rule. Otherwise, why even he formulates the rule, he formulates the parable to attack that rule, which means he was at least around them, even if he disagreed with them. So I think that's not an argument against him being in the scene. I think it's an argument showing he had disagreements with the Essenes, which doesn't mean well, he there, there wouldn't be the same rules because this is a religion that's for the Gentiles. They're not supposed to convert sure. and become... Sure. And, and and be observant of the commandments and the right. the mitzvahs and keeping kosher and circumcising because it wasn't in, it that wasn't for the Gentiles. They're supposed to come into right. the congregation, be grafted in as Gentiles. Well, that's why, be, that's why whoever Wait, Adam, I have a quick question for you, Adam. Mm -hmm. Would mm -hmm. the Jews also have to convert to Christianity as well, though, or not? Because if you're supposed to be a Christian, then what are you doing no, with all of these no. circumcisions and all that uh, stuff? Mm -hmm. When, like, when uh, Paul got pressed by the Jerusalem church about s telling Jews that they didn't need to keep the commandments, like he was scolded for it and said, no, he's not doing that. So, oh, shoot. Yeah, but already that seems like a disagreement from that early period as far as what exactly this is supposed to be about, right? Because if in as, the far, beginning, as far as we yeah. know, I mean, the Acts account is probably not historical and and uh, could be doctored and harmonized of n well, and not to, what actually happened at the split. It's supposed to sound like Paul is on a Odysseus journey going around and debating with these Athenian Stoics. And it's right. It's a, it's a narrative. It's, it's writing a fake story. Of course it is. Um, but you mentioned Peter setting up this church in Rome because what happens from, we look at the evidence and what, what we're told about, the uh, different sects of Christianity, Simon Magus sets himself up in this place. Simon Magus was basically just a Magi. I wouldn't even call him a Christian. He was his, if he, wrote, if he wrote a text called The Great Declaration. Everybody should read it. It is 100% Zoroastrian. Um, it is very Heracletian, too. It's got fire as the logos and all this stuff. Uh, God is being an all pervading fire. And uh, the, the Simon Magus, Carpocratians, they're all in Rome. Uh, the Valentinians are in Rome. They're all under this great, it's called the Great Ecclesia. Calcis talks about them. They're not, they're not, there's no heretics yet until right around 150 AD. So Marcion, whose father, this is going to get into the Jews, I promise. I'm going to bring you back to the Jews. Marcion, who grew up in Sinope, all the way in modern day Turkey, Cappadocia, Pontus, actually. Um, his father was Philologus. Philologus was the bishop of Sinope, one of the highest in the Roman church and the whole church of the entire empire. Probably he's considered one of the 70, which is supposedly he met Jesus in the flesh. That's what the, that's what the sources say. Now, we don't have to talk about that's true or not. But the point is, he was revered as one of the original 70 disciples of Jesus. His son is Marcion, the big heretic that everyone knows about, the big Gnostic heretic. Well, he, do suppose, you believe that? Do you believe that? Yeah, I do. Because I, I, I don't think, and by the way, the reason why I believe that is that's actually embarrassing to the people who are trying to, why would they want him? Do, why do would you they, think why the would, Marcionite why, Bible was the original Bible? That's what I was going to get into. Marcion mm -hmm. is the first Christian to put together a formulation of a New Testament with Luke, Acts, Seven epist by the way, it happens to be the but same. But there's church Bible. fathers before Marcion that don't have a new testament. We're aware of Paul's letters. But they don't have all they, they, everyone's aware of Paul's letters. They what they didn't do is they didn't take all the letters, put them into one book with the gospel and a 
extra and some philosophical doctrines and put them all together into one. That's Marcion's project, which becomes the um, by the way, a lot of heretics influence church stuff. But let's let's put that aside for now. Marcion travels to Rome with the, the, the amount of sesterises they said would be a, equivalent to like two point six million dollars. So are you a Marcionite? No, no. Oh, I love Marcion though. I think he's a he's. He, I like his story. He goes to Rome. Yeah, I have no bias in this. I'm not arguing for Marcionism, but he goes to Rome with all his money and donates it to the church. And he wanted to become the influence. He wanted to use his his money and his connections with his father. He wanted to take the church in a direction away from Judaism. Marcion was not a fan of Yahweh. We all know this. Everyone knows Marcionism. Marcion didn't like the Old Testament. His Bible didn't have an Old Testament on it, just the New Testament, just just not, just uh, Luke, Acts, seven epistles, seven letters of Paul, and he wanted to make Christianity into more philosophical, more philosophically informed, very Stoic, very Platonist, very up to times, and he got rejected. Do you think Paul's letters that we have today are the same as Marcionites, Mar Marcion's yeah, Paul's the, letters? The Gnostics revere Paul more than anyone else, but. Wait, you said yes? Yes. Are, uh, are seven authentic epistles of Paul are the same that Marcion they has? Are that's, the same. That's, that's an actual fact. They okay, are but it's so clear, though, that in those letters, Paul is, Jesus is the seed of David. He's the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament. He, he sure. died and was buried and resurrected according to the scriptures of the Old Testament. So how yeah, could he be anti-Old Testament if Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament? Because Jesus says that David and Jesus aren't the son of Yahweh. They're a son of a different God, the one, the monad. Oh, Dave, David's not either, okay. David's not either, right. That's, that's, but that's, Paul doesn't say that, though. Paul doesn't ever say that. Paul, no. Paul doesn't say so, that. And you could be right that Marcion is sort of yeah. twisting Paul. You know, I don't want to really get too sidetracked in the Marcion thing, honestly. There's no, a guy that comes no, into the spaces right. all the time. <laughs> He's uh, I, I, I believe uh, whatever Luke he had, I believe in Mark and priority, so... So I, I think Luke is a copy of Matthew and Mark, so so do I. I want to I want to reel it back into something no, I think is very up. relevant, pertinent to this, this, this discussion. This Let me just tie this up, and I'll finish. I'll, I'll let you change it up. The reason why I bring all that up is because we're, we're talking middle, early second century, and what we're seeing in Christianity is an, a movement away from the Jewish prophets and towards the philosophical doctrines of Athens. But it's. All of the Gospels and, and Paul's letters are all about fulfilling the Scripture and fulfilling what the, the prophets said. What does Paul say? I say nothing more than what Moses wrote, basically. Right. And I'm fulfilling, uh, you know, the prophets Isaiah and the Psalms and, and Daniel and all these things. They're targeting the high population of Septuagint Greek, not just Hebrews in in these cities, but also people who are. God fearers. They are, it started. They are, yeah, it started with the God fearers, the people that were that were wanting to convert. And this is why it's perfect. Exact, perfect segue. Are you done? Can I yeah, yeah, gears? yeah. Could okay. Tear that apart. All right. Acts fifteen, very famous uh, passage about how Paul gets approval from James and Peter to go be the apostle to the Gentiles. It says, even all the Gentiles who bear my name. It is so. James says, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted from idols, sexual immorality, the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. And, and most scholars and rabbinical commentaries say that this is a version of the seven Noahide laws. So that was the goal of Christianity, get them to worship the God of Israel and follow this Noahidic code. And if you see, even right there, two verses before, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, that's a quote from Amos 9.11, so that they may possess the remnants of Edom, which they interpreted as the Roman Empire, and all the nations that bear thy name. Now, Isaiah 65, Romans, sorry, Romans 10, Isaiah says, found by those who did not see. Why did Paul become the apostle to the Gentiles? Because of verses like this inspired him to fulfill prophecy and do so. Isaiah says, found by those who did not seek me, I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me, the Roman Empire. Um, that's from Isaiah 65, verbatim. Also, he Romans 9, Paul cites Hosea. I will call them my people who are not my people. That's from Hosea 2.23, verbatim. This is even in the Talmud, the same verse, Hosea 2.23 and 25. 
I will say to them that we're not my people, you are my people. Even those who were initially not my people, i.e. the Gentiles, this is from Safaria, Talmud, even the Gentiles will convert and become part of the Jewish nation. So they didn't want the nations there to dwell alone and kept separate. They wanted all the nations to worship their God, but not convert to Judaism. So yeah, but okay, they wanted to find Noahide laws, and the, all the rabbis say Christianity and I Islam is almost perfect Noahide because they believe in the oneness of God and the God of Abraham, and Christianity almost perfectly uh, Noahide minus the Trinity, which they view, some of them view as idolatrous. Before sure. Neil responds, I just want to say it's very funny how it ended up uh, not really working that well out for the Jews as far as them being persecuted by both the Christians and the Muslims, you know, especially now with Islam. So I don't know. At least all I could say is that for the people who think the Jews are so smart, if that is in fact no. what exactly transpired here, then yeah. they did not think things through really like well. That's a good yeah. point. Let, let, let me explain. Yes, right. they did suffer. They they were persecuted, but they also they view this persecution as stopping them from assimilating while they were in exile. And if you look in the grand scheme of things, I'm sure it was a lot more pagans who had their religions eradicated and forced conversions or 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 killed in all the Arab world over Islam, uh, over Europe, all over South America, like half the world. This religion spread to, so. Uh, I forgot where I was going with that, but uh, do I still have my share screen? Oh no, let me put that up for you right now. Oh, oh yeah. Th yeah, they were preserved because yeah, we they they have to be preserved for the end of time when they're supposed to convert. So Judaism is more stronger than ever now. And yes, m many Jews throughout history did per were, did suffer under persecution because Christians well, they're, blaming they're, they're, them for killing was, was, killing God or being. Uh, you know, the, the uh, devil is their father. These things that they say, and I condemn it. I think it's wrong. It's immoral. It's stupid. But it was the religion that ultimately is just in the New Testament. This is what the New Testament largely says. You can and, almost argue that Mars beyond. Oh, you got an echo. On. One last man. point. Ju Judaism also, Judaism as a whole survived and is now more powerful than ever. And the, it's a paradox of anti-Semitism, actually. I have the book, The Paradox of Anti-Semitism, which they see as very as beneficial in a lot of ways. They believe that they wouldn't have survived exile without this persecution, and they see it as a divine atonement where they were suffering and were refined through the fire in exile. And then finally yeah, yeah. they made teshuva, repentance, return to the land, and... Why am I... Yeah, so Neil, Judaism Neil, as a whole benefit. Echo. That's... So you know, that's you know, yeah. Neil, has, Neil to has to fix his echo, echo right, right now. now. Neil, you're actually off your audio. 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 Yeah. Mm. Very strange. Okay, now I'm not hearing myself as soon as Neil closed. We're good. We're good. All right, there we go. Yeah. So, I don't know. That is an interesting point, though, that, uh, Adam, uh, you bring up right now. I do recall this legend about the Baal Shem Tov, how he wanted Napoleon to uh, lose when fighting against Russia because he predicted that if Napoleon were to conquer Russia, all of a sudden there would be less pressure that would be placed on the Jews so they would start, uh, you know, not being Jewish anymore. And it is interesting, the fact that there is all this pressure that has been historically put on the Jewish people so as to not just keep them together, but also if you don't have pressure, if you're constantly living in the Garden of Eden, then you're going to start degrading over time. So it's a very strange thing to bring up. But I don't know, Neil, what do you think of that? I mean, it's, it's interesting because you're obviously looking at it hindsight. And right now, Israel is occupied by Jews and they have, um, you know, they it, have gone through many cyber they've grown as a cyber superpower and a military sure. superpower sure. Mm -hmm. um and I, I mean honestly you know obviously i've talked about this with lev and i mean they're also very western uh leaning in their in their fact that the people living in their cities are in like tel aviv are you know are allowed to listen to whatever music they want and they can wear yeah. bikini i went to the beach in natanya when i was in i went i was in israel for a whole month Listen, and let me just say this. I was in Israel for three weeks and I went to the beach in Netanya, which is uh, the above Gaza, obviously, not over down there, up north in Netanya. And everyone's wearing bikinis and having a good time and m listening to rap music from, from America. It was like being in the, any city. It's like being in L.A. Um, well, there's, there, there's another I... strange thing here that I just want to mention real quick, which is something that not a lot of people talk about, but back when we had uh, Jason Riz Giorgiani on BTR, I don't remember which episode, I brought this up to him and he agreed with me, that this other aspect of Judaism, which I think people don't focus on that much, is a argument against God, 
which is something that Jews end up doing where they're not just, you know, putting their butts up in the air and praying to God. Sometimes they would argue with God. Sometimes they would fight with God, wrestle with God. Israel needs to struggle with God. Exactly. And as far as just human development in general, if we're talking about figuring out like what exactly all this is about, maybe part of the lesson here is to ascend beyond just being a sheep and just looking at the book of Job and saying, well, you know, God's God, so better follow what he says. It's like, oh. no, maybe the reason for the book of Job is actually to question God. Just to think like, wait, why exactly is, is this dude? Well, let me, Re- let me, yeah, you know what I'm talking respond about. To that. Let me respond to that before Adam says anything, because I actually argue, I've, I made this point in some of my, my videos about that I've done about Judaism, that philosophical skepticism, like we see with Pyrrhus, the skeptic, who traveled the world with Alexander the Great, and then went back to uh, he went back to Alexandria while the library. He's one of the chief librarians during the first decade of the library, along with uh, Demetrius Philarion and some others. Um, and you can see how that philosophical skepticism influences early Juda- Judaic thi- Juda- Judaic thinking. I think, and uh, that's what it looks like. Because yes, in the Old Testament text. There are, and these, and I do think those texts are written prior to the Hellenistic age, where it talks about like which, which uh, animals to sacrifice and whatnot. But then there's a a total 180 against superstitions, like like with Heraclitus, where he says these people are talking to idols, like they're talking to a doorpost. They don't know the they, they don't know gods. They don't know the mysteries of gods or, or the, the nature of the gods. They're idiots. And that sort of mentality is very prevalent in Judaism. Idols don't do shit. Like, look at Elijah. He's taunting the prophets of Baal. He's saying, I can shoot down, send down fire from heaven. What, what can Baal do? Where is he hiding? Where is he? Call Baal. He's, like, calling them out. He's very being very skeptic, right? Um, so, yeah, there's that aspect, which is why, like I was mentioning, before I wanted to finish this point, because when I, I'm in Israel at the beach, and everyone's, it's, they seem to be very Western in their, in their uh, civilization, and then I flew down to Egypt, and all of a sudden I couldn't even get a hotel room with the girl I was with. We had to get; they made us buy separate rooms because we weren't we didn't have marriage documents. Israel didn't give a shit about that. So while they're conquering the world, blah 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 blah. blah I mean, everybody has wet. We probably have those same wet dreams in America yeah. with fundamentalist Christians. But, I mean, but it seems like yeah, the people who where did they get yeah. that though originally though like the the Old Testament is their Bible too it's the same source sure and I, I, look I I you're right they these texts exist they probably held on to them they probably read them and thought yeah. this one day we'll have our chance to because you know they're living in ghettos in the Holy Roman Empire and they're being per, to, forced to convert in some centuries depending on who's the yeah not all of them. No, there, I'm just wealth, the, the, there was wealthy families as well. Depending on where we are, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, their great, their great diaspora in Alexandria, there were some wealthy families for yeah. sure. Sure, sure. I mean, sure. It's, it's interesting to think about what would have happened with, let's say, the uh, Arabian tribes if they did not convert to Islam as far as what level they'd be li- living at. Maybe they would be living at a higher level. The only thing that I'm noticing right now is that the people that Neil was staying at, uh, you know, with his girlfriend after Israel, where was that, Neil, you said? Uh, somewhere... Egypt. Egypt. Yeah. Yeah. In yeah. Egypt. I would say that that mentality, at least, you know, culturally observing, seems to be more kind of like living in the moment, if you know what I'm talking about, as opposed to thinking about like the grander idea of like excusing certain things <laughs> like, okay, you know, let this guy and girl stay together. You know, it doesn't really matter that much. But living in the moment means, you know, if you steal, your hand gets chopped off, you know, that kind of society, which I think Israel has done a 180 you know against which is again like why i said earlier that the westernization that's going on in israel as well as um europe and the u.s in general i don't see that as a bad thing it has to be tempered with a little bit of uh, force too you know just to keep uh, society afloat well i brought that up because i I don't want to change the subject into like which is better judaism or islam i brought that up because um the point I'm making is if it's a world domination they're going after, they don't seem to be concerned with ma- forcing the Noahide laws yeah. or making anybody. It seems to be like they want power. Obviously, everyone wants power. 
but it doesn't seem like to be like this. Oh, everyone needs to bow to our God or anything. It's like there's a freedom aspect. Uh, you, do I need to read Isaiah 45 for you? Because that's oh, verbatim what it says. Isaiah 45 applies to Christians, too. They have Christianity. Exactly. Believe. And who are the Christians saying everybody's going to bow to? Yeah, but what is the context of Isaiah 45? It's the nations bowing down. Everybody who's Jewish but wants this to happen. It's just it's just a text that exists. Who cares? You know what I mean? It's the text that exists. Who cares? Well, there's this is one of the most influential religions, and uh, the, all the Abrahamic oh. religions stem from these sources. And there's sure. a lot of sincere believers that believe this with all of their their heart and want these things to be fulfilled. Right, but I'm saying, are, I mean, is it? I mean, it's like. Well, let's look at the Knesset in uh, in Israel. I mean, it's made up of wide ranging people with wide ranging politics from left wing mm -hmm. to right wing, and they're not all like these. They're not like priests, Levites trying to. No. It's not like this weird. It's not like this conspiracy. I didn't, I didn't say. I didn't say they all were, but it is a I'm growing demographic. It is one of the most extreme uh, religiously extreme cabinets in. Israel's history. There are a lot of M's. I mean, just the just the other day, the former prime minister of Israel, Ehud Barak, said that Netanyahu is like surrounded by extremists that want to usher in the the Messiah. I'm sure there's some that want to do that. Well, I guess in the best case, they could probably just use them as far as, uh, you know, having some of the people that are born to these ultra orthodox eventually, uh, you know, start thinking, oh, this kind of sucks. You know, I'd rather go to the beach and, uh, you know, have sex with these girls and all that. Like to me, it's almost no different. We, we have Mike John. Is that what you did, Lev? <laughs> I actually never. I, I never I, did. The I first feel night. that. I actually, even though I am a half Jewish on my mom's side, I never actually did the whole birthright thing. So I'd say Neil is actually more Jewish than I am in the sense of knowing Hebrew and all of that stuff. So uh, I appreciate Israel for, like I said before, having this more Western leaning and hopefully being able to keep the crazies under control. Because, like, the founding of Israel mm -hmm. itself had nothing to do, as far as I am aware of, with, you know, the red cows and all that bullshit. It primarily had to do with, you know, we're being destroyed over here. There's these pogroms. Why don't we have a place that, you know, we at least can trust that nobody's going to kill us? And ideally, this is not going to happen once people realize that Jewish people who aren't crazy and non-Jews who want to have a high trust society are natural allies. But that's like besides the point of this whole conversation. Mm -hmm. I do think that that's something that people should focus on a little bit more, though, considering mm -hmm. what we're kind of up against in the West right now. Speaking of the West, uh, I, I mean, I agree. A lot of Israel is modernized. It's it's secular. But the one of the most dominant religious forces there and in, in pervasive religions is like the ultra orthodox in Chabad Lubavitch, and their end times view is that it's instrumental that Edom falls. It's straight from the Talmud. It talks about Rome and Jerusalem, two nations in that in thy womb. Thy womb. Um, Jake, it's Jacob and Esau, the two twins of Rebecca, and this is the dialectic uh, dialectic of Jerusalem and Rome, Judaism and Christianity, and. Like Numbers twenty four seventeen, very messianic verse. This is where we get the star prophecy. This is written about in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and uh, Jews and Christians, rabbis and Christians, both agree this is speaking about the Messiah. This is why the nativity scene for Jesus has the star because he's the star that will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel, and it says Edom will be conquered. So a Christian at the time of the Roman occupation that views Edom as Rome. The Messiah is going to conquer Edom. That's the vibe that he gets right there. It, Edom from Safaria, it represents uh, the Roman Empire, or on Chabad's website it says, children of Edom, the descendants of Esau, represents the Greco-Roman world and the foundations well, of Western okay. civilization. So a lot of Israel is secular, but the religious faction that does have influence there especially with Likud and Netanyahu, they view Edom as the Western civilization in Christendom, and in the end times, it's going to fall. In order for Israel to rise for the Messianic age, Israel has to fall. Quick, quick question, sorry, though, before Neil. Rome has to fall. Quick question and, and, before, uh, before yeah. Neil about that. When it mm -hmm. comes to uh, the West falling in the Chabad Lubavitch uh, POV, as you said right now, does that have to do with the Messiah taking it over, conquering it, or does that just have to do with it being conquered by something else? 
Mm-hmm. I've heard both. It's it, some say that Israel is the battle axe that's supposed to do that. Others say it's the Messiah that does it. So it's kind of both. It's contradictory. Because here's the things. only reason why why I mentioned that. Mm-hmm. Talking with some people who S- same with not, the temple yeah. too. Is he going to rebuild the temple or do they build it and then he yeah, comes? Yeah. That's well, yeah, like talking both. with some people and some of them who aren't even Jewish. They see what's going on right now in our culture in general, where I wouldn't say liberalism. I'm a classic liberal, at least I consider myself to be one. More leftist thought when we have these self-hating uh, wasps who occupy positions of power, who want to be heroes on the inside, so they would rather destroy their society just so they are perceived as being more tolerant. I think that when Jews who are not leftists take a look at that for Messiah, they think, these idiots, what are they doing? At that point, it's not saying, well, we are going to conquer and destroy, yada, yada, yada. It's more of like, yeah, unfortunately, when people get into a certain mindset, when things get too comfy, some people who are in positions of power, like the World Economic Forum types and so on and so forth, all of a sudden they start thinking that it'll be a good thing to destroy civilization. What do you want us to do? You know what I mean? Like, that could be another way that this could be looked at, mm. where it's not so much of a, hey, we're going to conquer them. It's more of, unfortunately, mm. good things don't last forever, and, uh, mm. you know, they're going to destroy themselves through mm. their own actions and yada, yada, yada. Mm. Well, so, you know, my, my main thing is that prophecy is not real. I don't believe in the nation of priests and prophecies. Uh, I don't believe I'm agnostic. I don't believe that anybody can speak for God. Anybody that's doing that is just trying to control other people. That's my take. So I I just want to stop the Abrahamic end times uh, fanatic zealots in the that want wars and Armageddon and stuff like that, or or just like religious supremacy as as well. Uh, One world religion, which is what both Christianity and Judaism ultimately want, with the same Torah Messiah figure. Yeah, and I, I look, I I don't support any of those texts and think that there's a good text that we should promote those but it's to me i'm also going to say like it sounds like any other religious wet dream like in revelation where everyone's going to get sent into the lake of fire except for people who believe in jesus i mean the, that babylon t- is rome babylon represents rome, rome just like the fourth beast in daniel and and, and they the belief in judaism is that they're in the exile the final exile of edom right now and and yeah. Neil, Neil knows the Edom compilation I've done of all the, the rabbis talking about this that prophecy. Back, this goes back to the motif of the fleets of Kittim, which is the bo- fleets of what it was the Greeks at first, and then it became the Romans. They just it, they kept the name Kittim, um or Shittim. Uh, they kept the name. They just changed it from Greeks, Macedonians to Romans. But it's the same motif you see in the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. The flits of Katim become the sons of darkness versus the sons of light. And this is a prophecy of the end times that the sons of light would prevail against the sons of darkness. To me, this is just standard, uh, standardized, prophetic, to get your warrior spirits up, to get people to think God is on your side. You would see this in any other pagan cult. They would say they would check the entrails of an animal or flights of birds the priests would do this and say the prophecy the omen is good we're going to win the war and like this is just standard the only thing is with the with these texts we have them in textual form and it's a survived to today and it happens to be that the major three religions of the world sort of believe in that these prophets so we have them they're in our face all the time but they're not really different than any other religious zealots of any other cult they're all sort of doing this. They're just the one that was successful yeah. and spread to half the planet. Yeah, that's what it is. Right. But let, I mean, let I, me. Can you can you give me a minute? I got a couple things I think would uh, be really interesting. I want you to see. Take your time. All right. Okay, should cool. I put up the screen again? Uh, yeah. I got to press present again. Here we go, everybody, and be sure. By the way, if you guys are enjoying this, to like comment subscribe sneed those super chats we're getting some super chats in that i'm going to read towards the end and of course patreon.com slash break the rules become a patron today i'm getting the sun in my light right now i'm getting blessed by the sun over here which is a sign that patreon must be promoted and if you guys live in new york city we're going to be having new york city exclusive events and neil you've been to some of them we went to the uh museum uh, with uh, jason Giorgiani. that was pretty exciting right you're muted right now. Yeah, that was great. That was great. And we're going to be having a lot more of those uh, kind of events as well. 
for the uh, $20 patrons. If you become a patron, we're going to have live in-studio recordings of BTR episodes in New York City where you are going to watch as uh, I speak with the other people here, um, you know, about all this uh, kind of stuff. And then, you know, it's a meet and greet, so we'll hang out afterwards, we'll go to the rooftop, whatever, have a good time. But for the non-New York City people, you guys are going to get exclusive streams on Patreon.com. You're going to be able to ask questions for a lot longer without having to uh, do the Super Chats or any of that stuff. And MP3s of the episodes after they come out. But anyway, um, Adam, I am looking for your screen. I'm not seeing it yet. So there we go. Okay. Who's this guy? Who's this guy? So so here's a very uh, prevalent rabbi online. Listen to what he says here. How can I not be happy when I see millions of goyim bow down to one Jew tonight? <laughs> and he's talking about Christmas. How could he not be happy with millions of people, billions of people, 4.4 billion between Christianity and Islam, believing in the prophetic Messiah of the nation of priests, when that was their whole goal to begin with, right? Like I say, theological warfare. Uh, is that guy... Is that guy is that guy 18 years old? No, he's not. Here, <laughs> listen to this one. But deep down in their belly, they just can't shake this feeling that we run the world. So where does it come from? We run the world spiritually. Spiritually. God gave the Jewish people the through the Torah, Torah, the Bible at Mount Sinai, light into the nations and entrusted them to be a light unto the nations and to be the forebearers of God's word and bring it to the world. Bring the Torah to the world and Christians will not condemn the Torah. In fact, they spread the Torah around the world. Here, here's a uh, Jerusalem post a couple of years ago. The Jews should celebrate Christmas as a Torah victory over paganism, is the headline. Vladimir Minkov says, Rabbi Yeshua, who became Jesus Christ in the mind of that time of the pagans, fulfilled their mission by converting the pagans to the Torah-guided Christianity. And it said, because it is forbidden for the Jews to convert to Judaism, uh-oh, those who genetically are outside of the tribe, the only way to make the non-Jays to follow the Torah was creation of another Torah-guided religion. And they did this to convert the pagans. Um, All right. But right. Oh, 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 I can't. Yeah, you're still yeah, you're echoing. Hold on real quick. Uh, one more. Here's here's uh, a ah, famous friend, YouTube friend. rabbi, Tovia Singer. Everybody's favorite. I watch all his videos. The Jews, after all this time, we realize now, we're right. And, that, and there we have Jeremiah 16. And the, the Gentiles will come to you and say, surely we've inherited lies and vanity. There's no truth. Without Christianity, these Messianic prophecies could not, have, could never have taken place. I means why? Without Christianity, their Messianic prophecies could never have taken place. Uh, you mentioned our our boy Uber Boyo talked about the woke movement of Rome, the Antifa of Rome, pulling down all the pagan statues, uh, chopping off the noses, putting in uh, crucifixes. This is literally the chopping off the noses that the Christians did. A graded book I, I uh, recommend for everybody, The Darkening Age, gets into this. They chopped off the noses, and that's literally uh, outlined in the Talmud, in the Mishnah, about how to take away the magical powers of these pagan idols, was chop off the nose, and that's what the Christians did. Mm -hmm. um, now, th now, this is... I have a couple yes? of questions, questions, but I am still but I, okay. echoing, so I think so that's because... Okay, let me do one more thing, sure, like a, sure. a, a couple, a, one more minute of clips. Maybe you shouldn't tell anybody that I said this, but you know all those tropes about Jews controlling the world, or at least wanting to control the world? They're actually true. Our goal as Jewish people for the last 3,300 years since the revelation at Sinai has been to control the world. The vision is that Jerusalem should become a center of the world, political center, but more important, a center of the word of God, a center of the connection between, between humanity and God. We will rebuild the third temple. We will do and the temple of times. Okay, this one. Holidays, days of these these uh, Christians will, because they've been exposed to the Bible, because they know the Bible, they know the God of Israel, they know all the stories, they know all they know all the content of the Bible, that will lay the groundwork for them to be with us at the end times. That's basically what he says, and that, and really that's what the redemption of the world is all about. 
It's everyone serving the God of Israel together. Rather, the concept of chosenness designates the Jewish people's special mission to introduce the world to absolute monotheism and to an ethical value system. I believe the emergence of Christianity and Islam as great world religions represents a fulfillment of that mission. When the Jews were first chosen... Okay, I'll, I'll leave it there. I've got hours of material like this, of this, them saying this is the role that Christianity played to Judaize the world and to mm. uh, stamp out idol worship. Now I have a couple of questions here. So mm -hmm. first one, when we're talking about Israel as the light of the nations and all that, I have heard that before. But as far as what the end goal of something like that is, like I know, for example, there's this uh, weird rabbi who uh, was the uh, head uh, rabbi for the, um, not the Ashkenazi group, but the other one, he kind of looks like Yoda. He has these, he had these red glasses. You know who I'm talking about? The uh, Yotes. Oh, Daniel Boyerin? No, 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 no. He was, uh, hold on, his, pr man, I'm trying to find this guy. But he was basically talking about all this time uh, about how, you know, the Goyim should serve, uh, you know, the Jews and all that kind of stuff. So his interpretation was that it would be like literally, you know, we'd be sitting down like an Effendi, whatever an Effendi means, while, you know, they serve us. Then there's another oh. interpretation. You know yeah, who I'm these are about. these are quotes from a uh, chief Sephardic rabbi of Israel, Ovadia Yosef. Ovadia Yosef, that's like that. it. Yeah, yes. that's the guy. But then mm -hmm. we have this other idea of, for example, Israel being the uh, light onto the nations, as in we are going to. And I've heard this more from people who are Kabbalists. Like, for example, you could say uh, Michael Lightman, even though there's controversy as far as like is he the you know official descendant of so on and so forth. Lightman, Lightman, not thank Eichmann. You. Well, better late. Got to correct you there. Better Sorry. late I, than never. I know my rabbis. <laughs> yeah, Don't I clip know. that. So uh, when it comes to a uh, late and his worldview, I kind of like that because that has to do more with transmuting the quality of uh, giving into the quality of receiving. And he sees the mission of the Jews as being one to teach everybody what it means to give more as opposed to being more of an egoist. And in that way, you would lift yourself up to the state of the creator. Personally, I don't see that unless you're just being a complete idiot and think that, oh, by giving, you know, I'm opening the borders of Western civilization and, you know, to people who are going to, you know, do all kinds of bad stuff. If that's not your definition of giving, if your definition of giving is more like, hey, I'm going to look out for the people who are in my life, the people who are around me, that's not that bad. And if it ends at, let's say, Israel teaching other people how to do more of that stuff, just personally speaking, I don't see that as being the worst thing in the world. And a lot of the Jews who I spoke with, that seems to be more of the level that they're on, not this uh, Ovadia, Yosef, you know, I'm going to sit like Yoda and, you know, they're going to feed me dates or whatever. Yeah, he had like almost a million people come to his funeral and his son succeeded him in the position of chief Sephardic rabbi. And I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure that's like official government position in Israel, like an official government rabbi. That it is. It. But the other Said official those, government rabbi, yeah. by the way, was arrested for some uh, uh, thing related to uh, money that he was doing at that time. So anytime when it comes to like politics and these official rabbis and all this kind of stuff, there's going to be a lot more of these creeps and idiots and, uh, you know, really scummy people. And as far as the numbers, I've always been a believer in quality, not quantity. I think that there's going to be way more idiots out there who are going to be in favor of a lot of dumb ideas. But at the end of the day, there's also going to be people who were more, let's say, Western-oriented, including uh, Jewish people who live here, who want to be the best American they can be, who want to be the best Frenchman or Italian or whatever they can be, you know, because they consider themselves as part of this great civilization that we're in. You know, and sure, they could have, like, the menorah, they could have their parties, but just like Christianity... I think that those kinds of examples of Judaism is religion under the snow, if you understand my reference here. You know what I mean? Like, it's there on the surface, just kind of like an excuse for people to get together. But, uh, yeah, Neil, go About those sleeps, because I know Rabbi Tavaya Singer is a good friend of mine. I visited him when I was in Jerusalem. Um, he's, he's a good dude. And I think he can, I think from speaking to him about this subject, um, none of this is going down without the messiah 
So without, unless, if Judaism isn't true, this is never going to happen. They are, I mean, they, they're clear about this. No, There is no, like, going and taking over countries and forcing anyone to do anything unless the Messiah is there and everyone knows it. And he says, and this is actually Rabbi Tavai's own words, not mine, that the Messiah was going to do such wonders or that everyone in the world is going to know it's true. So my, I could say back to that, well, that's ridiculous. I don't believe in this. I don't think it's going to happen. But the only thing is, to me, that's a sign of relief because that's never going to happen. So it's kind of just a dream. It's sort of like a, our religion's going to be true and everyone's going to know it and we're going to be fulfilled. It's not a really lot. Good. A lot of their prophecies, though, Neil, are not supernatural and could actually come about. Like sure, okay. they're they're about a kingdom on this world. The messianic well, age is on this world. You know, they already resettled the land after well, exile. The, the, they're the, a rising power among the nations, the and now like they have Gog and Magog uh, like lined up. They're sure. they're okay. But the river thing from Nile, the Nile River to the greater what is it, all the way to Armenia or something? Tigris to Euphrates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that all greater Israel thing. They could have they they've given lands back to the Arabs. They gave the Sinai back to Egypt. They gave Gaza back to the Jordanians. They're not trying to expand right and, now. And they just annexed the Golan Heights from Syria and that, looks it, like they may be in it. They, they've been awesome. building settlements in the West was, Bank wow, and there looks like they're, they could be taking Gaza right now as well. Mm. They, well there's a, definitely a large portion of religious people in Israel that do want the biblical promised land, just, as well as Christians want them to have it. But how, but how much is that mustache twirling as opposed to, hey, they're going to be installing Katusha rockets on the border of this and that, so we have to make sure that there's going to be enough of a buffer zone so they're not going to be able to have rockets in certain areas. At least that's the argument that I've heard from people who talk about these settlements where, I don't know, like I'm curious, like what do you think about that aspect of it? Well, obviously, having a high ground gives you a military advantage, but there's other reasons they want the goal on. But I'll just I only mentioned that because yeah. Neil was saying that they gave up land, which, you know, they yeah. did take over the Temple Mount and give that back, at least uh, the East yeah. Jerusalem. No, but it also seems but, to be a game between the more religious ones and uh, the ones who are more secular where they yeah, see they're the infighting, military. Of course, yeah, they're they infighting, see the military absolutely. advantage. So if you were one of the Israeli generals that just want to live in peace, you know, trade with the Middle East. So we have the uh, Abraham Accords now, you know, with Saudi and so on. And all of a sudden you have these religious weirdos as a general, like, why wouldn't you use these religious weirdos to settle this land just to make sure that Israel's going to be secure and you're, we're not going to have rockets being fired upon? You know, like, why is that a bad thing it, from the perspective of like an Israeli general? No, yeah, I, I get it. I'm not disputing that. Um, as far as like everybody just like willingly believe in the Messiah, some of them do say that. But even the Safaria, William Davidson Talmud, a Reuven 43b, it says once the Messiah comes, all the nations will be subservient to the Judeans. And the word there for subservient, slave, servant, according to their own dictionary at Safaria, and this is like nobody's going to question this source. Even James Tabor, I just saw, give a huge endorsement to that. By the way, James Tabor also... Uh, all of the uh, connections between Christianity and the Dead Sea sects, like circumcise yeah, of the heart, out in the well. wilderness, the new covenant. Uh, there's there's a lot of things. Uh, Eisenman's work too. Tabor's it, lived is, in both. Tabor lived in Tehran for 20 years during the mm -hmm. 70s before they before the uh, the uh, big spring happened, and he lived in Israel for he's been in Israel for mm -hmm. like probably just as much time in his lifetime. He's seen best of both worlds, and he knows a lot about the inner politics. By the way, him and Giorgiani agree on almost everything. They don't even know each other. Everything Giorgiani says about Iran, Tabor also says about Iran. It's the same thing. That all the I'm, not there, I'm not familiar the with Giorgiani. Love the, West. the people there love the West. The government, yeah. people are, hate the government there. It's very true. Because someone who lived for 20 years told me that. But, but not, since we're speaking on Iran and uh, Israel and Golan Heights, check out this coin. You ever seen this before? Mm. There's oh, Donald you got the third Trump. temple coin. There's Donald with Trump. Cyrus. What are with you doing with that? <laughs> are you in the temple cult, Neil? Yeah, 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 yeah. But check this out. So that's King Cyrus and Donald Trump together. Now, why is that? So recently there's a video that came out where Donald Trump walked up to a bunch of Jewish kids. He goes, he's so, he's so crazy, Donald Trump. He goes, I gave you Golan Heights. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you like that? <laughs> he says he gave him Golan Heights. Well, she kind of did. But, um. That's 
they're trying to he's trying to be the but what what Cyrus did was relocated the Jews from Babylon back to Jerusalem, gave them their temple back. And when this coin got produced, they're trying to compare Trump as the Gentile because Cyrus is called the Messiah in the in the Old Testament text. He's called my the anointed one. He's called my and God says in the, in the words of God in the text, my anointed one mm-hmm. in Isaiah. Um so that's he's the only person in the in all the Old Testament text that's called my Messiah. It's, it's not even a Jewish person, a uh, per, Persian. So I brought that up because um, I think a lot of this is motifs that are being pre- re- reapplied to modern times, Gog and Magog as Russia and Ukraine. So I think there's this added. Iran. Yeah, I think this is just and a- Jesus is the motif of Joseph in Genesis, who is rejected by his brothers and then goes through his visions of prophecy, goes to rule behind the throne in the in Egypt, the archetype of the Gentile empire at the time. Yeah, that's another I meant to mention that. Hey, can you go back to my share screen since uh, sure. Neil uh, the reason why uh, exposed his temple coin? Well, you're going to you're, I'm going to have an echo, so don't put it up real quick. Last thing I want to say before okay. you bring it back. I'll let you take as much time as you want. I think it's sort of natural for people who are believers in religions to say things that normally would come off as kind of radical to some of us. But I don't necessarily think that these people are actually planning on doing anything with it other than reapply old motifs to the modern world. That's that's where I mean, I think that's kind of goes without saying. And plus, the Noah Hyde laws. There's nothing. It's not like the Noah Hyde laws is like everyone needs to stop eating pork. It's like the most basic shit. Don't worship idols. Don't mur- curse God. Don't murder. Don't steal. And establish courts of justice. Like some basic. No shit. idol worship and no blasphemy are the first two. Do you want to have blasphemy in there? I didn't think there was blasphemy in there. Uh, I believe so. Some of the, or, some or it could very easily they interpret it to be blasphemy. Wait, does no there's idol d- worship imply no more anime? No. Nah. No, no, I, just I mean, in a very literal way, like if yeah, we have the a first one, it's image blasphemy, on idolatry, adultery, blood theft. Yeah, it is blasphemy. No, but what exactly yeah. counts as this uh, idol worship, though? Like, I know I kind of said a tongue in cheek about anime, but in all seriousness, if you have like images that are depicting, you know, all kinds of things on the screen, would that count as idol worship if you become like a big like otaku or something like that? Like, how far would something like that go? When we're talking about like no idol worship. Who knows? Because it's not, it just doesn't seem realistic that it's like if if Judaism was true, which it's not. But if it was, and the Messiah really did come, and he performed all these miracles, then it's like the world at that point. It's like whatever, I'm going along with it now. What do you want? You know, there's been a lot of censorship. There's there's a lot of censorship, almost de facto blasphemy laws where you're not allowed to criticize God's chosen people. I had my YouTube channel of 135,000 subs banned a few years ago from youtube for talking about stuff like the third temple coin and uh in these armageddon prophecies um speaking of the coin and guys where are the super chats we need some super chats yes, at least for my guys give lev some support chats. thank you thank you very much well the super chats yeah. have come in and we're going to be uh talking about them uh in a bit here mm-hmm. and also once again patreon.com slash break the rules but uh adam are you ready to uh, put up the yeah. screen and again as mm-hmm. long as it's not something that the youtube censors are going to you know blast my channel over it should be good nope all, all kosher we're all good here here we go uh, here we go is it on screen okay so this is another coin that they minted along with the third temple coin the trump and bb Sons of Light and Sons of Darkness coin. The War of the Sons of Light and Sons of Darkness is a, a book that they found in Qumran in the Dead Sea the Scrolls. War, the War, War, Scroll. the War, Scroll. War Scroll. Scroll, exactly. The Sanhedrin mints in 2020, mints the coin for the Battle of the Army of Light and the Army of Darkness. After the conflict between Gaza and Israel started, Netanyahu said that it is the war between the Sons of Light and the Sons of Darkness. Um, the museum that holds the scrolls the architecture is symbolism of the war of the sons of light and sons of darkness you've been there cool and even gallant the idf spokesperson says this is a war between the sons of light and sons of darkness it's related to gog and magog uh war and here is war of the sons of light against the sons of dark here's a rabbi talking about it but the wikipedia sons of light and sons of darkness look at what it says again Sons of Levi, Judah, and Benjamin, so like the southern tribes, which are known as as Judah and Jews after the ten tribes are gone. 
will be in a war against Edom, so the Roman Empire, right? And you see this, this type of stuff. This was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. You see this in other scrolls as well. And they see, so Edom, the Amalekites, Philistia, Palestine, Kittim are known as uh, Gentiles, referred to collectively as the army of Belial or the ar army of Satan that they're going to fight in the end times. And he's saying it's the same as Gog and Magog, where, do I have it in this? Maybe not, no. This guy looks like a, wizard, looks by like the a way. wizard, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> he does, he does. So here it is. Sons of God, the son of God plate found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Plate four, messianic fragment. Read this. Tell me if this isn't the plan. And this is dated like 100 to 200 BCE, right? Is it, second, would you agree see. with that? No more echo, by the way, because I was stupid. I didn't mute your uh, uh, thing here. So now we can actually talk. Mm -hmm. Neil, we could actually talk now without the echo, even if the screen is up here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um... Well, you were you were gonna say something, Adam, about this? Yeah, are you familiar with this scroll? This is oh a, yeah, a, a, oh yeah. I got um, this. I, got, I read the whole entire thing. I got the uh, this the same book. Yeah, I got that exact same copy. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, look at this one. This one is huge. It says um, there will be violence and great evils. Oppression will be upon the earth. People will make war. Battles shall multiply among the nations. Like Jesus said, came not to bring peace, but uh, the sword and turn nation against nation. Like look at Christianity and all the bloodshed and all the forced conversions and all the wars, even between Christianity, between Christianity and Islam uh, until the king of the people of God arises. So the second coming or the M Moshiach ben David comes. All the people will serve him. He shall be great upon the earth. He will make peace and all will serve him. He will be called the son of the great God. He will be, he will be called the son of God and call him the son of most high. And he will, they will rule for a given period of time, the Christians on the earth and crush everyone. It, people will crush people and nation will crush nation until the people of God arises, the Jews, and cause everyone to rest from the sword. That's their uh, Isaiah prophecy you know, turn the weapons into plowshares. Yeah. Kingdom will be an eternal kingdom, righteous in his ways. Everyone yeah, so will make peace. This so, failed. So th this is a failed prophecy because Rome came and conquered them. This is before Rome. This is before their temple fell. I agree. That's, I just said that oh, 100 okay, to 200 saying, BCE. No, no. I'm just saying that this is the outline. Christianity is a version of this, basically. That's um, what I'm saying. Yeah, but Christianity is so opposed to, you know, the ones who don't believe in Jesus and who follow Mosaic law rather than faith and having, they're they're basically diametrically opposed. So here's the here's what I mean: the plan, if it was planned to have Christianity conquer everything, and then the Jews have to live in like ghettos and be forced under all these different. Uh, forced to live as second class citizens for two thousand years, and then once they get their chance to get make it back, then they will. That plan just doesn't seem realistic. But what, before what that, it was they occupied uh, Rome, occupied Jerusalem, and destroyed their temple. Before that, it was the Greeks occupying them. All right. of their history was being conquered by bigger empires. Sure. Every, but with forever. when Christianity became the the official religion of the Roman Empire, it led to them returning to their land, them, you know, where we're Absolutely. at today with Absolutely. most of the Republicans in America are Christians that believe you're cursed if you curse Wait. them, blessed Wait. if you bless them. They're Wait. the holy land. They're the chosen people. The church never let the Jews go back to Israel. It was Julian the apostate who hated Christianity that wanted to let Jerusalem. He, he almost was a third, mm -hmm. the third temple. Not, almost. not until the end of the age, the end of the era, and uh, when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, like it says in Luke. Right, well, and after yeah. Jacob's trouble and the dry bones prophecy of the suffering and the persecution, it, I don't want to get too deep into that. Well, well right that's now. what I'm that's saying. So, so what, what I'm saying is, it wasn't Christianity that brought them back. It was waiting for Christianity to stop having power, waiting for the Enlightenment, waiting for most people to start becoming almost atheist and returning back to uh, more of a liberal athenian type of mindset mm -hmm. and then do they believe in ages do they believe in ages and they believe oh. in in judaism that the earth is to last for six thousand years like the six days of creation and then the seventh millennium is the thousand year reign of the messianic like age in, in it's the like how they rest they work the six days and then they rest on the sabbath where they have the shabbos uh, goyim 
uh, work for them. That's in the Messianic age, the prophecy of Esau and Jacob, the elder shall serve the younger. That's what I, Ovadia Yosef was quoting and talking about. I think the so end of the, the as Noahides, recognizing their God as the one true God and grabbing their tassel and saying, we heard God is with you. I think the end of the world in the Talmud is like 4,000 or, no, or like 3,000 AD or something. Like it's we're not even close to right now. No, we're in the fifth the year the Hebrew calendar like fifty seven eighty something. So, so the Kabbalists believe that there's only another, you know, a few really? more years before the the end is yeah the six thousand years, and that the Messiah will come before then, but at least by then is what they say. I thought the Talmud has an actual date in there though. I have to mm. look it up. I mean, they did say that the Messiah is already born, isn't he? They had some picture of uh, some uh, Hasidic mm. Jews, and then no, that was fake. What was well, that? Well, they believe that in reincarnation, the Messiah, both Moshiach ben Joseph and Moshiach ben David reincarnate in every generation, but it's only if, like, the world is ready for them that they'll be Two, known. 2,239 is the year the Talmud says the Messiah will come within 6,000 years of the... Well, it does say that, too. But that for some reason, the date they have here is 2,239. I don't know where that number mm -hmm. comes from. Uh, the period that would be beginning of the period of desolation in two hundred twenty nine thirty nine at the end of the period of desolation three two three nine, so that's another two hundred years away. Well, well, here's Sanhedrin ninety seven B. Well, yeah, according it's about another two hundred years. Sanhedrin ninety seven B from Safaria. It talks about the six thousand years of the duration of the world divided into three groups of two. The two thousand right. years at the end are the period of the coming of the Messiah. Just like Christians have been waiting for the coming of the Messiah for the last 2,000 years. Now, this is the thing, though. And this is what I've been told from people who believe this stuff, who are rabbi, like rabbis told. None of, the, there's not, none of this happens without the Messiah. Like, there's no like going and taking over cities unless the Messiah is there. So it's like, does that make it any less? It does. Bad. It's not going to happen. It's Why just... not? A Messiah is not a supernatural figure in oh, Judaism. Yeah. It's no, just a political say, leader that they anoint as the Messiah. Let me say this. For anyone who's watching this in the year 2,239, <laughs> remember, I predicted this. So yeah. are you internet archaeologists that are watching this in 2009? <laughs> but the only thing I'd be worried about is so someone trying to self-fulfill this and make a Messiah. Which is what they do. I don't know. They're don't trying know. to hasten the Messiah. Well, who, yeah, is, not, who is they in this not, case, not, though? Because the Temple Institute, how yeah. much of the uh, Jews know about the Temple Institute or care about the Temple Institute? Uh, they've got a quarter million followers on, I think, YouTube or Facebook. Yeah, Joe Rogan has more followers than that, so that well, doesn't sure, really well, matter. Sure, but I mean, <laughs> so no, my to main... compare it to, to Joe Rogan. No, my main point here mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. when it comes to the religious Jews— Let's take a step back and forget that you're uh, atheist or agnostic. Uh, let's take that out. Let's assume, for example, that we're living in some kind of a multi-dimensional, um, you know, reality that is very manip manipulatable and in simulation, whatever the hell you want to call it, doesn't matter. But let's assume that there are certain things that could be predicted. Let's say, okay, if let's say Jews back in the day could predict certain things are going to happen and they interpreted them in certain ways is it their fault or is it the fault of whatever ends up happening in the society where the society is going to go through certain changes and at that point if you're the person who makes this prediction you say okay i foresee that this nation is going to fall and all that does that mean i'm making a nation fall because it almost seems like shooting the messenger at that point if we all of a sudden assume that mm -hmm. uh you know these things are real well, I, I don't see pro prophecy is the big deception. I don't believe in, in prophecy. And it is um, it's not a prophecy where anybody predicts things. It's a script. It's it's people saying one things in one context and then people reinterpreting these things out of context for sure. their time or their vision of what the redemption of the Messiah is going to be. And they follow it like a long term prophetic plan that they want to happen. They will it into existence. It's self-fulfilling through their belief, through their actions, trying to make it happen. It's following a but script is it only and a blueprint, their action, essentially. Though? Is it only their action? This is where it's I the Christians different. and the Muslims as well are participating in the in the judeo matrix there we go Abrahamic so if they're matrix. also participating in it how much mm -hmm. could you actually point at you know like the individual members of whichever jewish community other than let's say the temple institute in terms of people who are fast tracking 
the red heifer and the messiah and all mm-hmm. that stuff into existence because let's say yeah you do believe that the messiah is going to come and you pray and you study the torah and all that and you live off of the israeli welfare you are not necessarily participating in forcing God's hand. You're more just sitting back and waiting for this to happen. You know, maybe if some ID law comes around, some people will gravitate more towards the more extremist types. But right now, I'm not really seeing that much action here. What I am seeing more are things like the Abraham Accords, where, hey, we're making deals with these Muslim nations and we're going to be friendly, we're going to trade. That seems to go in the opposite direction than anything that we're talking about here relating to the prophecy. So that's what I mean. It's not just about... Not how Christian m- prophecy. Yeah. Christian yeah. prophecy calls for a peace covenant, a covenant of many for seven years. Mm, interesting. But do you see what I mean, though, Adam, right? Like, it's not just this temple institute and that's it there's people who are just gonna like what did trump say uh sit back and uh what was that quote stand enjoy the popcorn stand by and uh whatever it doesn't matter but yeah yeah let me ask you this what is more troubling about them reading scripture into today's times than today's christians reading revelation in today's times revelation wants us all according to revelation anyone who doesn't believe in jesus is going to be taken or uh, killed by the sword of Jesus and lake, sent in the lake of fire. Doesn't that, what if they f- can't see, you, I'm not worried about them self-fulfilling this, right? Like it, what's the difference? What I'm saying, it's just religious people have religious thoughts and they, they apply stuff to today. And it's just, to me, it doesn't really, I, I'm, I don't see any difference between somebody in uh, the Bible belt saying, uh, you know, the vaccine is the mark of the beast and revel- Jesus is going to be back tomorrow. To kill They're two sides of the same coin, Neil. They're all based on the same foundation. And, and in fact, they're, uh, the three Abrahamic religions are enabling one another. They're all codependents in this Abrahamic, you know, prophetic um, framework. And, and yet I do criticize Christians all the time for their belief in revelation and, and wanting the whole world every need to bow to the Messiah. You don't actually think they're going to do it, though. Like the Christians aren't going to pull some strings and have revelation. Sell I, I, I think that they'll try, and and if it's happening, maybe they'll sit back and say, "Hey, that's God's plan. Let it, let it happen." You know, be uh, be complacent about it. But uh, speaking of revelation, th- it's this is also the plan of revelation. I just wanted to share since you mentioned it. Revelation twenty four. I saw right. the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. That's what happens in Revelation. One thing. Also, Revelation fourteen seventeen, it says, um, talks about the sickle. Sorry, that's not the best one. This one's better. Nineteen fifteen, coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. Yeah, it also he will rule also- them with an iron scepter. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. Rule them with an iron scepter is Psalms two nine. Mm-hmm. But it also Which, says only 144,000 Jews from every tribe are going to survive. It's actually saying the Jews are in trouble, too. Yeah, I mean, all this stuff. They, it, it, they are, but I, they're yeah. not concerned at all. Uh, Christian end times prophecy is predicated on Judaism's prophecies being fulfilled. They return to the land. They restore the nation of Israel. They build a temple. They anoint a Messiah. They have the mark of the beast. They have the end times wars. And then Jesus floats down from a cloud and saves the day or they get raptured away. The rabbis are not concerned that that's going to happen. They're the originators of these ideas. They're the authors of these. They're the ones with all the esoteric secrets about it. They're not worried at all. They're using well, uh, the- a lot of that. A lot, I think a lot of the motifs in uh, you're right. A lot of this stuff comes from Daniel and Zechariah. hundred percent. You're right about that. But I also mm-hmm. think a lot of the Sibylline Oracle texts, which are Greek sure. texts, have a lot of like, like Nero. That comes from Sibylline Oracles. Nero as the beast. That's from the Sibylline mm-hmm. Oracles. Nero, the sons of Belier. It says uh, the, the, from the line of okay. Sebastianus, which is Augustus mm-hmm. in uh, in Greek. That there, so you have that. There's that. I, there's that aspect of it. Um, I don't know why I brought that up, but I guess what I'm saying is, yeah, I agree you, with you. I don't see how that's relevant though to like the the religion that it is today, the right. institution that it is today, the the, the canon why. that it is right now, like this, where it says Psalms two nine again about Jesus talking about the nations. My king, I installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Can you share it, Lev? Uh, one second. Here we go. You are my son. Today I've become your father. They interpreted this about Jesus for the Jesus narrative. I will make the nations your inheritance and the end of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron or an, a scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Be wise, you kings. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and settle with trembling. That's 
what Revelation is about. Sure. The Messiah conquering the nations. Yeah. I mean, um, so if I was to like say what I think happened and how he ended up in a situation like this, I don't think it was planned to, you know, we're going to be in a diaspora for 2000 years and then get our nation. That's the whole plan the whole time. I think it's all the cards ended up landing in this position that they did. And now Israel has his nation back. And now they're looking back and saying, Oh, look, scripture was fulfilled. I'm saying what I'm saying is I don't see it as a necessarily, it's a horrible plan. We're going to, all right, we're going to lose our temple. We're going to be in diaspora amongst all these nations that hate us for 2000. And none but, but of us, aren't they a religion of exile? Is an exile part, like, uh, in, like a foundation who, of their identity? Isn't the persecution by the true. nations also that's crucial true. to their identity? True. True. It isn't, wasn't there anti temple sex before Christianity that saw it as corrupt and uh, the Daniel prophecy that the sanctuary would be destroyed and the sacrifices would cease? And, and they all believed in the Daniel timetable 70 weeks prophecy that they uh, calculated to be sometime a mid first century as well. Yeah, but the sacrifices seizing thing was um, for Antiochus and Onias. Which, That's which what it was originally about. But then when that didn't happen in the Forge book of Daniel that we're talking about right now, they reinterpreted it for the That's first century. Do. That's what they always do. Mm -hmm. So it's just like it's going to no matter what time we're in. They're going to take the text and they're going to say, here's what it means today. It's all wet dreams, in my opinion. They're all just it's just religious wet dreams. That's all it is. Wet dreams for what, though? For whoever reads the text, whoever whoever believes in it. So okay. on, the, on the Christian side, they look at Revelation and they go, oh, mm -hmm. this is going to happen. And then the Jews who are uh, religious and devout, they're reading Talmud and they're reading the prophets and reapplying that to today. But I don't think the plan was, I don't think Isaiah thought that like, I don't think he did either. I, I don't think he did either. They were completely ignored all the context of what it was originally about. And just they saw all of the scriptures as like a divine puzzle where they're searching closely yeah. for mysteries and, and, and secrets to be revealed about the coming of their Messiah and redemption. And that's when they connect similar passages in Daniel and Isaiah and Zechariah and Psalms. And they put together, they fabricate and concoct this savior from the scriptures. And that's where, where Jesus originated. Josephus yeah. is the one who tells us this. He says that the he says the Essenes do this too, and the Pharisees as well. Uh, the Sadducees not as much because they're just all worried about the temple. But he says that their what they do and their practice is to look at scripture, rewrite it in modern and apply it to modern times. So this is what they were doing in Josephus's time in the late first century. Which look at Christianity, it is. One of those things. They're reapplying scripture to Jesus. So they, that is a, that is in fact, and I'm, I'm not. I think not, they're inventing I'm, Jesus from the scripture, not applying it to Jesus. Sure, they're. It, does, it doesn't even matter at this point. If whether he they apply it to a real guy or they made it up, it doesn't. The, the result's still the same. So that's why I just say they're probably. I just grant that there's a guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But no, I agree. I'm I, I'm actually agreeing with you. Like yeah, that's what they were doing. You're saying talking. I'm right. I won. I'm, I'm saying you're right that they reapply scriptures. To modern times, so I, I'm agreeing with you on that yes. part. That's, that's a fact. That's a fact. Yeah. Well, the um, the only big question is uh, where do we go from here? I mean, we are going to be doing super chats, but as far as what conclusion can we draw from uh, this conversation uh, slash debate? Uh, I don't know. Like uh, Adam, what would you mm -hmm. want people to get from this? That it's a myth. It's fabricated. It came from Judaism. And ask who created it, who invented it, and why for to achieve which goals, which objectives. And I think it's clear from the scriptures what that is. Like, for example, if I you could share one more time, and I got to go pee so bad, you could go to the uh, super chats. But we talked about the light into the nations, the servant. A very messianic text is Isaiah forty-two and forty-nine. It talks about my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one. He will spirit upon him. He will bring justice to the nations. Everybody thinks this is about the Messiah. In his teachings, the islands will put their hope. He establishes justice on the earth. So this is the nations, all of the world, will put their hope on the Messiah. That's how they read that. A light for the Gentiles to open the eyes that are blind, free the captives from prison. That's, that's quoted and put in the, to the mouth of Jesus. His praise from the ends of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you islands. Um, he will triumph over his enemies. Those who trust in idols will be turned back in utter shame. And okay. And then Isaiah 49, the other one about 
light into the nations. Just to give you the idea of what Jesus as the light into the nations is, you distant nations called me in my mother's womb. You are my servant concealed in his quiver. I will make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation, Jesus, his name literally means like Yahweh's uh, savior, Yehoshua, the salvation of Yahweh, Yahweh saves. Salvation of, yeah. Yeah. And Judas, coincidentally, it means, you know, Judah uh, or Judeans, yeah, yeah, that true. my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. That's the goal. Kings will see you and stand up. Princes will see you and bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One who has chosen you. And here's the best part now. King, they will bow down before you with their faces to the ground. Think Muslims prostrating themselves to the God of Israel. Think uh, Eastern Orthodox Christians bowing down and prostrating. They will bow down before you with their faces to the ground. They will lick the dust at your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Mm. What do you think, by the way, that was the major plan? Uh, final, I know you got to pee. What do you think is the major plan with the uh, Muslims, let's say, regarding uh, uh, the Jewish religion? Because they have the Dome of the Rock and all of that. They don't really seem to be big fans of the Jews. So maybe we could say this works out in favor if you believe in the whole pressure turning stones and diamonds type of thing, where there's so much pressure on the Jews today that they would transcend the state that they're in currently. One can talk about it like that regarding uh, what's happening with Islam. But any other thoughts on that before you got to go pee? Again, remember, they view Islam as almost a perfect Noahide religion. They, they circumcise. They believe in the God of Abraham. In fact, Islam even adopted the identity as the Arabs are the descendants of Ishmael, which is the view that they had for them in Judaism before the Quran and Islam even started. And then they view Christianity as Esau, Edom. So in, in the end, there's going to be a war between them both. Also, some type of alliance where they turn against Israel, but then destroy each other. And then in the end, as, as all nations, they say, we inherited lies from our forefathers, and we heard God is with you. And then they follow them as Noahides. Wow. Otherwise, the Messiah, as Maimonides says, there's punishments for people that don't want to believe in the Messiah and the God of Israel in Ready? the end times. Ready for this? The, this is what Josephus says in Jewish War, Book 2, Chapter 8. These are the divine doctrines of the Essenes about the soul, which lay unavoidable bait for such have once a taste in their philosophy. There are those among them who undertake to foretell things to come by reading the holy books and using several sorts of purifications, being perpetu perpetually conversant in the discourses of the prophets, Isaiah, stuff like that, and it is but seldom that they miss in their predictions. So, it's true. seldom. So he's saying they're right about their their prophecy. He's basically saying they have the power of prophecy. He's trying yeah. to sneak that in there. That's funny. It's, funny. Mm. It, 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 it's Josephus also that talked about the prophecy that had all of the uh, messianic ambitions in the first century, which is yeah. why I think they placed Jesus uh, at that time <clears throat> or believe he had to do his sacrifice, his uh, heavenly sac sacrifice. I saw Derek from Myth Vision commented way long ago, uh, quoted Jesus saying, my kingdom is not of this world. That's just a uh, allegory met, um, to explain that he's in he's the platonic ideal form of the Melchizedek high priest that does this atonement in heaven originally. But I'll be right back. OK, read Super Chat. Pardon me. All right. Take now, even break. though we're going to be reading Super Chats, if those Super Chats are related to you, I will read them once again when uh, you come in here. But by the way, everybody, be sure to subscribe to this channel right now. Like I said before, we have people like Curtis Yarvin here, Jason Resiger Johnny, which uh, Neil and I had an amazing event with him in New York City. We were uh, talking about Nietzsche, Stanley Kubrick, Eros. It was quite a great time. And if you become patrons, we are going to be having various uh, dinners in New York City, get-togethers, and uh, live recordings that you guys could attend. I mean, obviously, there's some vetting involved here as far as, you know, like meeting people, getting to know them and stuff like that. But there's definitely going to be a lot of cool things coming up. I am also going to be sending out invites to the uh, Lemon Party After Party, which I can announce right now. It's happening in New York City in the uh, Chinatown Dime Square area, and that is going to be a lot of fun. I believe Lemon Party, you know, Ben Avery, Tim Dillon's former uh, producer, he probably has uh, some tickets left to the uh, 5 o'clock showing in New York City, and I can uh, post the link in here as well. But if you go to patreon.com slash break the rules, become a patron today, you are going to get a link to that after party. So uh, 
and I think that's going to be uh, happening. Definitely, yeah, that's going to be happening on May 5th. May 5th is the day of the Lemon Party after party for all of the Lemon Heads in the audience here. And Neil, what do you have coming up right now, buddy? Oh, I got a video coming out, uh, another documentary coming out pretty soon on it's actually tr it's actually tracing all of the roots of monotheism uh, into the three major before the three major religions that we consider to be monotheism. I'm showing like how the pre-Socratics had monism, Platonism comes along. Um, I'm even talking about Otanism. I cover Freud's book on Moses and Akhenaten. There's some stuff on that. Uh, I talk about some interesting stuff about this character Moses or Moseus, his name is of Athens who a lot of the early Jewish sources from at, from Alexandria are Toponus and um, Aristobulus of Alexandria, Alexander Polyhistor, mention that this character, Musaeus of Athens, was the historical Moses. And no one ever talks about this. It's a character who's this, supposedly the son of Orpheus from like the 9th century BC. We're talking, he's so old, he's mentioned by Pythagoras. He's mentioned in like the earliest writings of Greeks are mentioning this guy. So, I mean, Homer, I think Homer even mentions him. So, um, this guy, he's a lawgiver, he's a prophet, he's a he's a, uh, a musician, he's a priest, he's all these things that Moses is doing, he's doing the same thing Moses is doing, but it's not down in Egypt, in Israel, it's up in Athens, and he's giving the laws to the Phrygians. It's really, so it's like, is this another, I don't know, I'm exploring that story, and I'm showing the sources on that, and I'm basically just going through all these alternative histories, uh, Tacitus, and Plutarch and a couple other authors, um, uh, what's his name, uh, Alias, um, a Roman writer, tell a whole different story about the origins of Israel, which is that they actually come from Egypt, not during the time of uh, Ramses, but way later, the 24th dynasty, which is 700 BC, under this King Bacchus, king of Egypt, who kicks them out because they all had these diseases on them. And Amon, the god Amon, and the oracle tells them to get them out and let, send them to Syria. And there's a whole different story about them worshiping a, a, a donkey in the desert. They, the first animal you guys see that gives us to water, we're going to worship that. And the, the donkeys lead them to water. This is a story written in the sources, in the primary sources, first century BC sources that mention this stuff. So I'm, I'm doing a video on that. It's coming out soon. They got to do a sequel to uh, Shrek with a time machine. Where Shrank and the donkey uh, take it to the past, and then the donkey ends up becoming. Uh, anyway, I'm not gonna get into that right now, but uh, let's go for the super chats, everybody. Here we go. Let me just load it up here. And once again, be sure to click the bell, add the like. The like is very, very important for the algorithm. Add the like right now. Anyway, here we go. The Blackfish, 20 Canadian dollars. The Abrahamic God commands a reset to year zero for the conquered. No memory for Amalek. What we know of ancient peoples who were conquered had a Abrahamic lenses. Early Christian means early BS. Great video is always Adam. Any thoughts from Mr. Blackfish? You're muted. You're muted. You're muted. I can't hear you. Adam, you're muted. You got to unmute yourself, buddy. I got you. There we go. Yeah, thank you for the super chat, and th thank Lev for uh, setting it up. It was all him. Blame him, guys. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so next one we have Vesperion. That would be a good new uh, EV evolution. Uh, uh, interesting. Christianity, Jewish psyop comes from the uh, Zittler right. I don't know what Zittler is supposed to mean. Is that supposed to be like a combination of hitler and zion i don't know anyway i've uh, never heard it yes uh we have over here uh arcade outpost ten dollars judaism is a racial religion with a living record of their success failures as people christianity islam are universalist hamster wheels of fairy tales for the non-j that erases history and peopledom who's that for Oh, well, for everybody. Well, it is true that Judaism is more ethnocentric and based on like the holy seed and passed on, um, you know, to generations where Christianity and Islam are u universal religions that are what? more about proselytizing and getting everybody to to believe. It's, yeah. it's like ju Judaism opened up to the Gentiles, Judaism for Gentiles. 
Mm. Yeah, no, and uh, uh, that's what I mean. So when I think, I think the roots of the religion, not, not Israelite religion, because that Definitely. could go, we can say the Canaanites and polytheism and Yahweh and El being different gods and Asherah and all that stuff. That's Israelite cults that are happening prior to the Persian period. Because, and, and this is actually coming up in my next video. If we look at the Elephantine text, these are Jews living down in Egypt. They got there after Nebuchadnezzar sacked Jerusalem. They went down. It was like an exodus backwards. They're all their texts that we have, the dating from like 500 BC to 420 or 450, like in that period. So we're, we're talking way late in the game. We're talking way later. They, like the tradition says, like Moses and Abraham and all that was already known well, well known by that. They don't, there's no Moses in any of these texts. There's no Abraham. There's no Noah. There's no David. There's no, there is Yahweh. He's called Yah O. And then there's other gods, Osiris and Asherah and all these other different gods and Baal and all this stuff. So there's no Exodus. There's no, there's no nothing. There is no Torah at all. So what the basic one I'm bringing up is the Persian period is where you get the roots of what we know as Judaism. And it's obviously the monotheistic approach, which is very Zoroastrian, um, sets up a perfect religion for a nationalistic focusing on the temple the period the people living in that city in jerusalem and it's not really um expand it's not really focused on expansion at that point christianity comes along during a different time period when the roman imperial cult is in full swing and that's what it adopts this evangelical expansionist policy so that's the big difference between judaism as a nationalistic religion and Christianity as a globalistic religion. Interesting. Let's move on to the next Super Chats over here. I mean, as far as uh, that, I had a recent conversation on the official BTR Discord, which, by the way, here is the link. I don't promote the Discord as much as I really should. But uh, we were talking about, you know, ethnocentrists and all that kind of thing related to Israel. From Again, I don't live in Israel. I only know of people who live in Israel. But from all the information that I've gotten so far, they do seem to have a lot of, you know, like um, Arabic is the second language. Even though they don't force non-Jews to serve in the IDF, they still have volunteers. So, for example, there was a decision made to have people from the uh, Druze community also serve in the IDF. And that was kind of like a decision of the entire Drew's representation there, I guess the leadership to uh, enact that. But as far as just like the way people live, there's no second class citizenship as far as like, you know, you wouldn't have access to, you know, certain legal uh, things or any of that stuff. No, like everybody in that sense is equal as far as being citizens of Israel. Obviously, it's not perfect, but I just see that when it comes to these conversations, we should definitely look at all the religious stuff and try and figure out what's going on with that. But just judging a nation as far as how it's been performing when it comes to the rights of its people, I've so far seen way worse. And it just seems like people are so obsessed with seeing Israel and the Jewish people in general as like this hydra, like this dragon, you know, as if like once they chop the head off the dragon, everything is going to be great. Wotan is going to come back and we're going to have peace and prosperity. But... I really think what may be going on here is just, I don't know, I just think that a lot of Jewish people are very smart, and you tend to stand out when you're smart, in general, just like in any part of society, and then people start getting very suspicious, and uh, you end up aren't, having Aren't there smart do... Gentiles as well, though? Absolutely, 100%. Yeah. But and isn't there as... way more Gentiles? There are way more Gentiles. But as so far does as that groups, really explain it, then? As far as groups... You're going mm -hmm. to have a lot of, as you know, like Jewish uh, grand chess masters, you know, nothing to do with any ethnocentric. Great uh, script writers, right? Script Get writers, great, great exactly. at coming up with scripts like Absolutely. the New Testament. Yes. Comic books. Or the Coen <laughs> brothers, for instance, which are very, I'd say, America and Western um, uh, uh, centric. Because you wouldn't look at the Coen brothers and say, oh, these people are, you know, doing some scheming and messing up the minds of these, you know, innocent Americans. Like, no, they love American culture. They love the West, you know, um, no country for old men, all that kind of stuff. The point that I'm they're dumbing us down with dumb and dumber. Don't you know that? Just kidding. The, po <laughs> the point the main point that I bring here, though, is that mm -hmm. most people are going to see things from what 
from the media, right? They're gonna see things from major publications like the New York Times and so on and so forth. They're also gonna see things that are, let's say, more right-wing adjacent, you could say more conservative from things like the Daily Wire. But as far as things that people have been making the 4chan infographics about, you know, blaming the J-Dogs for all these kind of things, would any J-Dog who was against wokeness, who was against leftism, would any of them even think of working in those publications, the ones that end up being the publications that a lot of people see? They would have nothing to do with it. But because of the nature of the media, what are most people are going to see? Of course, they're going to see a lot of that shit. So how exactly would you answer that other than saying like, hey, maybe you guys should go out and actually meet more Jewish people and try and understand that most people in general are the same as far as most people are normies. And I think a lot of Jewish people in general are also very scared of there being some kind of a uh, uh, woke backlash against them. So that's why they kind of just mind their own business just like anybody else does because I think most people are scared too. But they happen to also have jobs that are in the cities, right? You know, urban population. And if you're growing up and, you know, you could either become like, you know, a successful doctor, lawyer, scientist, jazz musician, pretty much any occupation that I could think of right now, you're going to find Jews in that occupation, which is both art, science, uh, anything. But the occupation that's in the media, that's what most people are going to see, right, Adam? I mean, I hope I'm, like, being clear about this. Like, I don't want to mince words when I'm talking about, like, the problem I'm seeing here. Problem you're seeing with me? No, not with you, but oh. with how people are perceiving what's going on today, where most of the, thing that's, most of the things that they're seeing, mm -hmm. it's going to be coming out of a lot of leftist media. The people who are of Jewish descent who have nothing to do with leftist media. They're not going to work in leftist media. So you're not going to hear you like religious. People. You mean like right wing? Not just Jews, no, not just uh, religious. I wouldn't even say right wing. I would say just like generally classic liberal kind of Jews that just want to mind their own business, you know, raise their kids, you know, have their mm -hmm. kids, you know, have a good position in life, you know, have a successful job where they can provide for the family. You know, this is what most people want. Jewish families, you know, tend to stick together. All people, usually, I think. Yeah, all people. Yeah. But Jewish mm -hmm. families, a lot of them end, end up very focused on the family. You know, the whole stereotype of the Jewish mother. I mean, I, I guess I kind of have a mother like that myself, you know, like who's very focused on making sure her son, you know, does his homework and, you know, minds his studies and all that. Kind of like the Asians have the tiger mom. So when you have a focus like that, right, and you live in the city and you have a certain amount of jobs that you're going to be able to get. If you get a job working at the New York Times, you're probably going to be somebody, Jewish or not, who's going to have the opinions that the New York Times is going to like. So most of the things that people are going to be seeing from publications are going to be filtered through that kind of filter. So they're not going to hear about people who don't want a lot of the bad things that are happening right now that are turning you know, this uh, country into a low trust society. They're not going to want that shit to happen. But how would anybody who's going on 4chan, who's looking at those infographics, even though those people exist? Well, yeah, I've... I've always said it's not everyone and it's not only them and it's there's different factions and most of most of them don't even know about any of this stuff any of the any of these verses any of these kabbalah prophecies but there still is it still is you know pervasive within the believers within the religious people this still and it's not like it's just oh well they're the you know radical extremist interpretations i showed you guys all the verses they're they're very straightforward actually but here's it's the only not difference really open though. to interpretation but here's the only difference though at mm -hmm. least again i like going to the russian turkish baths in new york city it's a great place we should go there sometimes when you're going to be in the city and there's a lot of hasidic jews that go there the vibe that i get from a lot of them and from the jews who i've talked to is that most of them just want to be left alone and just like read the fucking Torah and just like, I don't care what's going on here. I don't care what's going on with the Gentiles. Just let me read my Torah. Leave me in peace. Maybe I'm also like working in this diamond business or whatever. And that's fine. You know, who cares? The point is, is that that's the vibe that I get from them. The vibe that I'm getting from a lot of Muslims today is not that it's we want to acquire more people who believe in what we believe and we want to expand. 
it's a very different thing. So when you're talking about these prophecies, like we were talking about uh, throughout this whole show, if these prophecies are such that they're going to be self-fulfilling, other than certain radical sects that are kind of like ramming the poor cows through, you know, leave those cows alone, man. I hope those cows are not going to be killed. I hope they'll, you know, live a good life, you know, in a rescue barn somewhere. But anyway, they're wrapping, they're putting those cows through. But most of the people who I find who are Jewish, they don't even care about that. They just want to read the Torah and hopefully the Messiah is going to come. But that's it. So it's more of a question of force, like who is forcing what right now? And I'm really not seeing a lot of this kind of ramming through on behalf of even the religious Jews, even if they believe it. Um, well, they've never been proselytizing in the sense that they want anybody else to convert to Judaism, but it, in the last few decades, largely starting with Chabad, now that they're in the position, the, the safer position that they are in the modern world, they started promoting the Noahide laws. And it is a growing movement. To, uh, uh, Neil's friend Tovia has boasted about his great success in converting a lot of evangelical Christians to be Noahides. And it, it is their long-term agenda. It is what they want. And even if it's just a few of them, and uh, eventually I think that's the direction that religion is going to be heading, more to a more philo-Semitic, uh, Judaizing Hebrew roots of Jesus. That's just the trajectory that it's on already right now. Well, what, and, do, what do you think of like the whatever um, podcast and Chris, Do you people, think Christian, yeah. Christian in nationalism contrast. in America is, is rising right now? I mean, it seems the right to. wing is dominated by Christianity. You have to yeah. agree with that. And that's just, you know, a version of Messianic Judaism. It's Torah Messianic Judaism. But they seem to also love posting the happy merchant memes. Like, here's the other thing about that, because... Mm -hmm. I was uh, just mentioning right now the whatever podcast, and I see there being this thing. I don't know, Neil, if you're also recognizing it, where sexuality and, you know, wanting to coom and being very coom brain, because a lot of Zoomers are, even though they're not having any sex, most of them. There is this combination of that along with this trad nationalistic Christianity, which we do see in things like the Whatever Podcast, for instance, when they have these OnlyFans girls, they bring them on. Some of them end up converting to Orthodox Christianity or Catholicism or whatever. And then you have uh, people like uh, Sovereign Bra, for instance, who I would really want to talk to. But from what I understand, he grew up, at least this is what's written on the website, he grew up in a Jewish family and then he converted to Christianity. Really? And yeah. Sovereign bra? Yeah, that's what wow, I... Wow, that's new info. <laughs> that's what I read on the website. Again, could be wrong. What website? Because that... they say that about me all over the internet, too. No, that was on true. the whatever podcast website. Look, if I'm <clears throat> talking out of my oh, ass, wow. then let me mm -hmm. just make sure about it. But when I just uh, looked it up, that's what I saw. Uh, so I'm going to look at it uh, in a short while. But the point that I'm getting to, though, is that that seems to be the Christian nationalist that is not a big fan of Judaism in the least. And most Jews, like I said before, they don't really care about proselytizing or doing anything. They just want to read the Torah, while people who are more on the radical end, my concern is mm -hmm. that they may want to have a government which is based, and red-filled, which is based on having an authoritarian top-down structure. And I think that kind of structure will deteriorate over time. I don't think it's just like the extreme of Judaism that want to have a Moshiach one day and want to have the um, the messianic prophecies eventually fulfilled. Like that's that's the foundations of Ju of Judaism. Those are like the main the main things. Like the vast majority of re of of religious uh, re religious people in Judaism, they they do want they are Zionist. They do identify as Zionist. They do want. They would like to see the temple rebuilt. That's that's a growing, mainstreaming type of thing, especially in Israel. Like mm. to say that, like religious people, they don't really believe in their religion. Like uh, it's almost like no, they believe. Uh, I never said they don't. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying mm -hmm. that they believe, but they just don't do anything about it. Like they're just uh, worshiping and reading the Torah. If that's the mm -hmm. level of their belief, who cares? Mm -hmm. Well, most of them like aren't in the position to do anything about it, really. They're taught just like keep doing the mitzvahs and then they're they're healing the world to kun olam by doing their mitzvahs. That's that's most of them. But I mean, Chabad, like I said, uh, Chabad is a very influential religious group and they were on the top 50 list of most influential just this last year. Well, I don't know if I told you this. Uh, one time I was walking and a Chabad guy who was drunk just 
grabbed me and started dancing with me. And it was a lot mm. of fun, but he was just he tied like, you up with his leather strap <laughs> and started dancing with you. No, the leather strap uh, that that did happen in certain other occasions. I wanted mm. to see if it would have like any Kundalini flow occur from that. But uh, un unfortunately, unfortunately not. But uh, anyway, let's go to the other super chat. And I'm looking over here as far as uh, uh, Chase uh, from. OK, so here's where I found it. Uh, Whatever podcasts dot com. I don't know if that is their official site or not. Um, our team writes a blog centered around the themes discussed in the Red Pill podcast. Come along, explore alternative viewpoints. And here it says, uh, meet the multi-talented 28-year-old co-host from the Whatever podcast, Chase, who was raised in a Jewish home, undertook a spiritual journey that eventually brought him to accept Christianity. So again, well, if this is something that is completely fake, then I was fooled and we were all fooled. So again, like... I'm just bringing it out there just because it was written here. Mm -hmm. But either way, like that shouldn't matter because I generally think that if somebody is of any faith and they have good intentions and like Chase, I want society to be well ordered for families to take care of each other, you know, for kids not to, you know, go to the wrong side of the tracks and get involved with gangs and all of that. Like, I think like our ultimate telos here in the end, and I think same thing with Neil and yourself, Adam, is that we want to live in a high trust society, which uh, is not going to get abused and trampled upon, right? I haven't thought of it in the terms, the language of like high trust society. That's not like the way I've thought of it before. Uh, I I like to live in like a good society, peaceful, you know. Yeah, but no that crime. comes that but that comes from trusting the, that the people around you are going to behave in such a way that lends itself to a good society, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, well, like I, I said, I'm not against a high trust society. I'd like to be able to trust yeah. people. That's one I don't thing. Know if it's smart to trust everybody in the one thing about Egypt, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. it's full of people who are out in the streets panhandling as garbage on the ground the nile river was green the pyramids have plastic everywhere but the people there were very there was no crime there no people steal no one no one's stealing from you you can leave your uh wallet on the ground and someone will pick it up and bring it they're you know they're they're afraid of, of or what's going to happen if they commit those crimes like they, it's a very religious place they're very muslim um but it's like capitalism on steroids it is all free market. You can't even walk two steps without someone trying to sell you something. In fact, I, I was I was thinking of Egypt. I uh, I still have some of my money um, from when I was there. They have Amenhotep on the cover of their two hundred pound. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no. Um, I don't know if I'll ever go back there. Mm. Well, let's continue on with the super chats. We have a little bit more here. Uh, so here we go, everybody. And again, be sure to subscribe and all that good stuff. Here we go. Oh, and we have a Patreon. Anthony pledged $5 via Patreon. Thank you so much, Anthony. I appreciate it. Over here we have uh, da, 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 uh, John Dominic, four ninety nine. Didn't the parables of Jesus denounce Judaism? Yes. Um, and actually, let me share my screen for once. I he got says he's sure. fulfilled Judaism. He said the Pharisees sit or... Yeah, he said oh. the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. It's, he said salvation is from the Jews. He said uh, they're... He also curses them, though. Like, look, here, I got my screen shared. When All he right, curses well. the fig tree... Hold on, let that's me about load the it up temple. here. That's about go. the temple, though, my well, understanding. You can, say, you can say it's about the Sadducees, but look, but here's where here's where you, you, the, the author makes it clear on who he's cursing. So he comes and he curses, see in the distance, the fig tree... He says, may no one ever eat from your from fruit from you again. So in between the time between the cur the the withered happening, this happens. And then on reaching Jerusalem, he enters the temple courts, drove out those that were buying and selling in there. And uh, so and then, he, you know, he says, you've made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers heard of the law, began looking for a way to kill him. And then when evening came, look, the fig tree was cursed and withered. So. The author is making it clear who he's actually cursing. The fig tree represents, I guess you can say the temple. So, yeah, I guess the you temple can... and the temple sacrifices. That's the theme of Hebrews as well. That the sacrifices yeah. weren't enough and they needed a perfect heavenly sacrifice that they wouldn't have to do every year. 
right? I mean, I guess there it's more nuanced than just saying he's cursing Judaism itself. What what the person that step or in the super chat say he's no, cursing? He's, he's he says the fulfillment of, of Judaism, not not one jot or, or uh, what is it tittle of the law will be changed until all is fulfilled. It's all about fulfilling Judaism, right? But, but then you also get in other in other parts in different gospels. You also get him basically relaxing the laws and saying things like uh, for you know, the Gentiles. Primarily, well, the, the, Paul, Paul's letters are, are targeting the Gentiles. Paula Fredrickson's the pagan apostle. Well, no, 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 but yeah, that very I, well. I agree with all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But Jesus himself even says, "Go ahead, get your animal out of the ditch." On a, what are you dumb? He's the one eating uh, food on eating grain on mm -hmm. the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. He's breaking the laws. That's break. That's he, that's not. He's trying to out Pharisee the Pharisees with his with his uh, expert level level sure. pill pull. Mm -hmm. Sure. Now we have a very, and I don't very... think it was him. I think it's the authors. The authors, you know, right? Telling we're stories just about saying, him. We're yeah. just saying that, yeah. Now we have an extremely important super chat here from uh, my good friend uh, Anton of Anton and Roanoke, Texas, of Anton's Biltong. So if you guys, and I don't know if this is kosher, I got to check without Anton, but if you go to landofbiltong.com, and I'm going to post the link in the chat as well, you are going to get access to amazing quality biltong, which for those who don't know, it's a South African version of jerky, but it's much better than jerky. It even has some uh, probiotics in it, I believe. And if you type in code BTR at checkout, you are going to get free shipping, my friends. And I guarantee you, it's going to be well worth it. Get the beef sticks. And if you are very, uh, you know, health conscious as well and conscious of the environment, I would also look into getting the, uh, well, the bison is good as far as, you know, farm uh, raised, not in like cramped conditions and stuff like that. So personally, like if there's bison, I would definitely go for the bison and they should be restocking bison uh, pretty soon. They also have very spicy version of the biltong as well. I know, Adam, are you a spicy fan or not? You are? How bison how and spicy fan. Yes. Nice. How spicy would you go? Like, would you go all the way to uh, Reaper Pepper? Oh, no. No. Because they got yeah. reaper pepper too. They have ghost pepper. They well, they got chili pepper. They got reaper pepper. They got ghost pepper. Uh, Neil, where is your pepper uh, alignment? Like, how far would you go up the spice level? Um, I don't know. I'm not too crazy with it, but I, I don't mind a little spice there. You know. All right, but uh, anyway, landofbiltong.com or built or uh, antonsusa.com, BTR at checkout. Go there right now. Great sponsor, just all around great dude as well. And you guys are not going to regret getting that. Anyway, back to the show over here. We have um, Maria Irbis, 999. What do you guys think about Sabatai Zebi and Jacob Frank? Did J. Frank and Rothschilds found the Illuminati in the U.S.? What do they really believe in? Both of you guys, what do you guys think? Uh, I don't know about Jacob Frank and the Illuminati. Um, I know, you know, Sabatai Zevi obviously thought he was the Messiah, and then he converted to Islam, and everyone hated him. That's a crazy story. But uh, <laughs> Some people still thought he was the Messiah after that, too. It's like, no, it's, it's all 5D chess, dude. Trust yeah, yeah, me, bro. yeah. Yeah. So, um, as far as the Illuminati, though, I think that comes from the Adam Weishaupt in the 1770s, the Bavarian Illuminati. Mm. That's what that comes from. But, yeah. by the way, speaking of Christianity, this is a blow your mind. There was an early group of Christians called the Montanist. The guy who baptized Tertullian, one of the church fathers of, of Catholicism, they call him the father of Latin Christianity. He was baptized by a guy named Montanus, and his group of Christianity was called the, the Illuminati. So there, were the, the, there was an Illuminati in Christianity in the second century. And their central text was Revelation. And everyone hated because these people were, were a bunch of heretics. They had women as pr pr uh, priestesses. Mm. Prophecy, no one else was doing that. Um, and they were, they were people hated them. They called them a bunch of heretics. But Revelation, their book, made it into the Bible. It's the last book to make it in. It's in like the four, fifth century. They finally included Revelation into the Bible. The, Revelation was not a part of the Bible until way later. Mm. Qumran identified themselves as the sons of light also, and it kind of sounds Gnostic, the idea of like the enlightened knowledge. Yep. But um, my understanding is that 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 theory that Jacob Frank started with uh, Adam Weishaupt started the Illuminati, that as far as I know, the source for that is Rabbi, a book called uh, To Eliminate the Opiate by Rabbi Ant Antelman. And I'm not sure if it's just, you know, something that he made up or if there's actual proof for it. 
but uh, Zabatai Zevi was just a a Zionist movement, a messianic movement. Half of the world at the time believed he was the Messiah. He was re- trying to return to the Holy Land. He was influenced by Kabbalah also, yeah. but then eventually he was forced to convert or willingly converted, who knows, or, or, or some of both, to uh, Islam. And then Jacob Frank uh, came along after and kind of picked up where he left off. Did he and say then he eventually, was the reincarnation of him? He, uh, yeah, reincarnation of him, yeah. exactly, yeah. And that he, he eventually, and his followers, converted to Christianity. Oh, wow. And as far as like the anti-Semitism in the New Testament, I think one verse alone uh, really sums it up perfectly. And it's Paul in Romans eleven twenty eight. It's as far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. Yeah. Speaking to the Christians. Well, as then, far as then you get revelation, but, you get they call them themselves Jews, but they are not that yeah, I was talking yeah. about Christians. Yeah. But as as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. And, and Romans 11 and Romans 9, I mean, Romans 11, Paul says, did God reject his people? By no means. And that they're only hardened temporarily, and they're stumbling, according to the prophecies, but not stumbled beyond recovery. It, because of their transgressions, salvation has been brought to the Gentiles. So it's a good thing, really. They just fulfilled God's plan for them, according to the Christians, to reject their Messiah, to fulfill the prophecies, to bring in the Gentiles. They had to be... Uh, branches had to be cut off for the Gentiles to be grafted in, but it's still, like as Paul says, do not consider yourself superior to those other branches. If you do, consider you do not support the root, but the root supports you. So it yeah. has this love-hate relationship yeah. in it. They're yeah. chosen, but they're also villains and cursed. But that's largely changed now with uh, doctrine. Yeah. By the way, real quick, uh, did modern day debate that they take uh, your video off? Because I'm just curious here. They're talking about this. Like, is it it's not YouTube that's taking it off. It's more of like the creators who do the videos with you and they decided to uh, remove it. Um, one of them I did was Stuart uh, Nettle. He's like a TikTok apologist. And I think they changed my name on it in the thumbnail. I don't know why they did that. And another one I did, the other people, you know, went off the hinges. And I, I completely understand that they didn't want to leave it up and put the channel happened? at risk. What happened when you debated on the Crucible? Tell Love that story. It's so funny. Um, I've debated on the Crucible like three or four times. And I have a debate next week with an apologist there as well. And uh, the last one, though, it was some boomer Protestant that calls into their show, and he was losing so bad after like 30 minutes that the host hopped on and, and kicked him off and ended Andrew? the debate. Yeah. <laughs> I can see him doing that. Wait, who's Andrew? It's the Crucible. Oh, it's oh the Crucible guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, didn't you also debate with the guy that Sticks Hex and Hammer 666 debated with about pornography? The uh, skinny looking guy who's very. Oh, popular. E. Michael Jones. Yeah, I've, I've e. debated Jones. a lot of Christians. Maybe I think I've debated uh, on, on this corner of the Internet. I've been debating more Christians uh, than anybody. I, 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 I all the big Christians, Michael Jones, uh, Jay Dyer. They're all blocked. Me. I talked to them one time. They all blocked me. Yeah. Well, you and the tr- Christians you, you are all over the Internet before. spreading yeah. conspiracies and lies about me like no other. And they never they never address any of the points I make. So the Christians lie and just uh, ad hominem and make lies about me. And then the other side, the uh, YouTube atheists largely dismiss me and, and ignore everything I say, calling me anti-Semitic just for the stuff I talk about yeah. today. I mean, look at it this way. BTR is a stream of peace, and I like having different viewpoints on. Like I told you before, I'm half Jewish, you know, on my mom's side, so that makes me officially 100% J-Dog certified. Mm. But when it comes to what exactly our goal here is at the end of the day, I don't really care about the religious aspects here. What I care about is, well, personally, just trying to figure out exactly like what all this reality is, but also, you know, care about my family, the people around me in my life, but also... I want the people who don't mean any harm to other people and just want to live their lives. And if they have what it takes to live within like a Western society, then there shouldn't be anybody that gets in their way. And that's why I'm not really a big fan of like the Wotanist, so to speak, because I really think that they're very trigger happy and they have a lot of bloodlust inside of them where they're like waiting for the time that Kalki is going to arrive and is going to destroy all the people they perceive of as being their enemies. You know, it's like a very black and white thing there. And I honestly don't really think a lot of those people have had that much experience talking with Jewish people in general, unless it's like the fucking, you know, 
ADL or like all the people that they argue with uh, over on uh, Twitter. So that is something that I do want to address because I think it's not like I want everybody to think the same, but I do believe that there is like a civilizational level that a lot of people happen to be in. Most people go along to get along, and most people, unfortunately, are, can be swayed into adopting a more fundamentalist stance if, you know, the right person comes along. But I don't really yep. think it's that bad out there, man. Like, I do recognize the bad elements, and I want those bad elements not to uh, be there, but it's all a matter of talking and well, figuring this whole thing out. You know, it's funny because during the time when Jerusalem was being sacked by Fl the Flavians, we had, you had one son, Titus, knocking down the temple in Jerusalem, and then the other son, Domitian, up in Germany, sacking the Germans, and uh, wasn't very successful. So, wait a minute. God lets the one temple burn that they worship, that worships him, but then the, the heathens, they survive and make it out somehow? Like, what's going on? You know, this is funny. But yeah, they had that in common. They're both, they both getting attacked by the Flavians at the same time in 70 AD. Hmm. All right, we are uh, finishing up the Super Chats here, gentlemen. So here we have so much from the Aquarian TV that it counts like one big Super Chat over here. But before Aquarian TV, I'll save him for last just because of all these. John Dominic, 999 for both. Did Jesus exist? Why or why not? Go! I think not. I think he's fabricated whole cloth from Scripture. Neil and uh, yeah. oh uh, yeah yeah no that's, that's real enough. quick like yeah mm -hmm. yeah so I think there's a guy I, but I agree that the evidence is so bad like the, he didn't write anything down his apostles didn't write anything down Paul is the first text we get never met Jesus um, the only thing we get from stories of eyewitnesses are Paul talking about people who knew eyewitnesses like he said I met someone who who knew 400 people who saw Jesus risen that's it and then there's no there's no archaeology. Like they say, we had the true cross. All right, that was discovered by people in four in like the fourth century. They just randomly picked the place and said, There it is. There's a piece of wood. So there's no archaeology. There's no text. There's just it's just hearsay, right? The text, the evidence is bad. And then by the time you get to the gospels in the I'll say 70, all the way through about 120. So it's between 70 and 120 is when the gospels are being written. You're getting a narrative. Of, and like we said with the Essenes, they're applying stuff to possibly a guy who lived. I mean, I'm open to the fact that he didn't exist at all. But I think if that was the case, I think you would have a lot more contesting in the sources. I think you'd see a lot more hostile sources. Like Celsus would just, and, and when Celsus is writing, he would have just been like, no one's ever heard of this guy. I don't think he existed. But so that's part of the reason why I lean towards there being a guy. Plus some of the, some of the details about him. I don't think they would have made up. So I think there is a chance. I think I think it's more likely, not 100% sure, but I think it's more likely that someone did exist and all this stuff is being applied to him. Hmm. All right, guys, let's move we, on. we could do a whole. I'd love to do yeah. a whole debate just on I'll mythicism with you. Mm. Well, yeah. Over here, we have Alonzo, 499. Great show. Make a poll to determine the winner. We already did that. And uh, Neil, I'm sorry to say, buddy, but you are not in the lead. Adam is in the lead with, uh, let's see, how much here? Uh, 72 I voted for you, Neil. Oh. 72. Damn. <laughs> Good shit. All right. But you, I wouldn't say you guys disagreed that much, honestly. But uh, here we go. Uh, the Aquarian TV time. Yeah, going in the age of Aquarius and all that, right? It's only fitting. Uh, 4 dollars for all of these. So let's start from the beginning. Um, great for having Adam on. Thank you, Derek. Next. I did have a stream with Derek back in the day. Do you remember, Neil? But I would definitely love for uh, for Derek to uh, come back on real soon. That would be a lot of fun. For sure. Uh, Aquari, another one. Uh, henotheism, not monotheism, is Judaism. Okay, what is henotheism? Yeah. So that means that you believe in the existence of all of other gods, but you only worship and devote to one. And I agree. Judaism, I think, is, is very much like that. Um, I think I don't think there's any pure monotheistic religion that exists. I think Islam is probably the closest thing to it, but even Islam has different spirits and yeah. diff different jinn and Satan and all these different. So at, at at the end of the day, none of them are purely. There's only one divine being. There's always some other divine being. To, to be fair, though, the jinn they're not at the same level. They're more of like whatever God created. That's that's the same as Platonism. 
the monad on top, and then there's lesser terrestrial yes. beings, celestial terrestrial beings below it. Well, this is why I always had a problem with the idea that it was God, you know, with a capital G that was intervening when it comes to the um, destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, when it comes to, and Adam, you could tell me if this is correct, where it was written about how it was the Lord and his angels that appeared before, who was it, uh, Abraham. Was it Abraham? I don't remember exactly. Lot? Lot. Uh, no, yeah, a lot. I'll say lot, whatever. But he appeared before them, and it was written that it was like the Lord. That would mean that the actual, like, the God appeared to them, if I'm not mistaken. I could be mistaken. Mm -hmm. I'm, no, I'm there, is a verse, there is a verse in the Old Testament where he appeared to people. Yeah, Moses. Moses. No, before Moses. If we're talking about that whole thing with Sodom and Gomorrah, if you look oh, at okay. you know, like Abraham, then yeah, the, oh, Abraham, yeah. So from what I understand, with Abraham, the Lord appeared before him with his uh, angel friends. So you tell me if that's correct or not. But I remember talking to you about this before, and I think people are not making more of a big deal about this as they should, because that would be, hey, God is like in the flesh. He's right here. God, everybody look, it's God. And people forget about that. Like people would focus on, well, Moses saw the back of God when he, uh, you know, went into that U UFO, you know, so on top of the mountain. In in um in in Hebrew, I'm looking it up right now. It yeah. does. Say uh, Elia Yahweh. Yeah, it says Yahweh appeared. Yahweh. Genesis eighteen. Is that Genesis what you're eighteen. At? It literally says Yahweh appeared to Abraham. It's it's exactly what it says. There we are. So much for your transcendental God, Jay Dyer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What does yeah. Jay Jay have to say? Oh, it just means Jesus came. No, but no, again, it's again my interpretation as is Jirjani's is that this was actually like a dude who was like a Star Trek type, you know, commander of these other, you know, uh, l beings who were there, and these are like the Elohim. Like, these are... The what? Want to see the text? Sure, absolutely. Let me uh, load it up here. People, people know we're not lying. Yeah. He's also a volcano god, too, right? Yes, I did a whole video on that. Yeah. So here it is right here, It says where it says the Lord, but if you look at the Hebrew, there's Yahweh right there. Mm. And by the way, if it says... Whenever it says son of God or, or angel, it would say benai Elohim. But it doesn't say that just says Yahweh. So that's it's that's blasphemy. that's a true that's a true translation and God or the Lord or whatever appears. So that that's not a that's not a mistranslation. Adam is correct that it does say and the Lord appeared. That, yeah, good call. I forgot about that. Yeah, well this seems to be more like some if this exists cuz again, Adam you could be completely right that these are all fairy tales, but if these are not fairy tales, this could very well be like these advanced godlike beings that were you know creating civilizations on earth and all that stuff you know like all those old sumerian gods and all that kind of stuff so they just like paid a visit to this place and did this and that and you know they have a little record about that you know that they kept so i don't know that's another interpretation of this whole thing with the hebrews e enoch is like the, a i'm yeah. sorry I, no, go the, for the it. book the, the books of enoch are like a play on the genesis and the nephilim breeding with uh, the women and it's one of the things I had to cover today, but because of time, I won't. But there's so many, uh, so many verses in Enoch that talks about the Son of Man and the role of the Son of Man. And uh, four of the five uh, books of Enoch were found at the Dead Sea Scrolls. So these are pre-Christian. The similitudes, the parables also probably, I believe they're pre-Christian or at least uh, rose simultaneously independent of Christianity. But it identifies Jesus as the Son of Man. New Testament identifies Jesus as the Son of Man. The Son of Man and Enoch, it's light to the Gentiles. Uh, all who dwell on earth shall fall down and worship before him. More and more of these verses like I showed all throughout Psalms and Isaiah just... Uh, I cover it in other videos if you guys want to see more, because there's a whole lot more to this uh, theory, this premise. Sweet. And here we go. Here are the final Super Chats from uh, our main man here, Aquarian TV. Uh, I kind of imagine him typing all this from, like, an aquarium-like uh, enclosure, like Hampshire. If you guys ever get a chance, look at Hampshire. It's a project this guy did where he took these hamsters in an aquarium, and he created, like, this whole undersea world that these hamsters lived in. Like, they weren't, you know, they weren't breathing water, obviously. Like, he had oxygen tanks in there, but it's pretty cool. Anyway, here we have um, Judaism believes in Shekinah as a goddess, so not that monotheistic. But the Torah yeah. that we have 
has it talks about a share of polls also and it's like against it they did some doctoring and well, harmonizing because... to get rid of the multiple gods exactly if, if l is a canaanite exactly. god that they turn that the hebrews adopted uh ball is his son so i guess jesus is ball right well that's what the, the super chatter saying shekinah appears in these texts that if you take the text at individuals as individual text then yeah you can pull that out but once you have the redactors come along which i say starts in the persian period ends in the hellenistic era then that's when they like you said they harmonize everything they try to edit everything to make it into one god but, but before that yeah absolutely it's multiple you think gods. that happened when they did the septuagint translation yes. i think right before the septuagint is when you mm -hmm. get the final redaction of the hebrew bible maybe mm -hmm. maybe maybe a few decades before maybe 50 years before but it's somewhere mm -hmm. somewhere between the persian period and the time of Ptolemy II. Hmm. And finally, we have this one from the Aquarian TV. Sounds like Lev is working through some personal identity issues here. That's healthy. Any thoughts on Lev working through his identity issues? I'm curious if you were, if any of these new verses, messianic verses that I showed today, if, if they were new to you, if they were eye-opening, what you thought about the, the presentation. Mm -hmm. Again, it comes down to more what it means when you say light onto the nations. Because if it's just an example of Jews thinking that, oh, we're going to be these educators to show the rest of the world what it means like to get along and be friendly and all that stuff. To me, that really is not the worst thing in the world. If, however, it's like that Yoda looking dude with the red glasses, what was his name? Rabbi Ov Ov Ovayada. Avaya, Avadia, Avadia mm -hmm. thank you, yeah. Hey. If it's more like, you know, we're going to have the, you know, the Gentiles work for us and, you know, slave under us and we're going to, you know, set up like a sultan or whatever, you know, that's ridiculous. You know, like that's the differentiation that I would make there. And I'm sure that there are people out there who are so egotistical, that's what they would want. Likewise, there are people who are Jews who would want to have like, you know, the spreading out and even have a term of that in the Kabbalah, like the spreading out of the inner light, like the reflecting of the giving light of the creator the radiance. Yeah, the radiance. Exactly. That really is not the worst thing in the world, man. I don't know. Like just taking that for, you know, literally what that would mean. There are far worse things that have occurred in the world than emphasizing something of that nature. And the second thing I would say is that when it comes to the prophecies, if, for example, the prophecies are real, a lot of them happen to come from the changes that happen within civilizations and society. And at that point, like, what are you going to do? And again, like, I know you don't think they're real and you may be completely right. Mm -hmm. But if these things are occurring and somebody else just like reading the Torah and maybe has this fan fiction in their head of believing that this is, you know, mm -hmm. some great prophecy, as long as they're not forcing God's hand, you know, as long as they're not doing anything of that nature, I really don't care. And Make it right. Yeah. Well, it doesn't matter if quick, they're, they're not real. The prophecies aren't real, but they believe they are. So it's like they might as well be real, because if they think they are and they act in their their attitudes and behaviors and uh, actions are like uh, dependent upon the, those beliefs. They are trying to ha uh, hasten these things. Not all of them, but you know, a percentage, a portion, well, definitely do. Portion is different than not all of them. Mm -hmm. This is the other thing that I also notice in, let's say, more Jew-hating circles, where there are people who I've talked with who say, "Well, you know, I don't hate all Jews," or so. Well, like some Jews are good. It's like. The mindset, it's like you're trying to, I'm not saying you, just to be clear, Adam, I'm just saying like in general, people who I've spoken to, they take like a certain portion, you know, just like Hermann Goering did. They take a certain portion and say, well, these are the good ones. And the entire schema in their heads is one where they just see it being like this inevitable dragon that's out to destroy humanity and maybe like a few portions, a few cells of this dragon are good. Well, in the reality, like I said before, what I think is going on here is like, yeah, we have certain religious crazies, but then we have most of the Jewish people who just like study the Torah and yeah, they expect it to happen. But you said a key word, which is doing right. Like as far as what they would actually do to make things worse, mm -hmm. that's where I'm like mm -hmm. still confused. By the know? way, I wanted to check into it. The Septuagint also says, uh, 
de auto theos pros, which means and God appeared to Abraham. Like it doesn't even change it. They keep it. And the reason why I think that matters is because Christians will say, well, our Bible is the Septuagint. So it's like they can't even they can't even get out of that one. God appears to Abraham in both texts. But he can do anything. I guess so, he wants. It's, it's they'll say he, he's yeah. God. He can he can appear if he wants to. Yeah. He can become a man if he wants to. He can split right. the Red Sea if he wants yeah. to. Yeah, it says he stood at the foot of the tent, like he's standing. What do you mean he's standing? Right. <laughs> who, who who's that top scholar that's that's interviewed on all the shows? She's a, a female, kind of attractive. She wrote a book all about Francesca, like the Francesca Chavica. Francesca. Yeah. yeah, tough last name. Um, Francesca. Yeah, she wrote a book all about like. Uh, I guess the anthropor what's the word? Yeah. Uh, uh, God. Anthropos. Oh. God has a body. Anthropomorphous. Mm. Yeah. Oh, the God word. has a body. I think it's called. Yeah. Yeah. God has a body. It's a really good book. It shows all the evidence of texts that point to God having like one of the chapters is about his phallus. Mm. There's a there's a there's a verse where there's a mention of the God's phallus. It's I forgot which verse it is, but it's in there. It's in her book. And that's why I take that to be more of a uh, advanced human being than a uh, God himself. But anyway, uh, we have one more here, uh, Dr. Manhattan. Uh, you guys do a, a part two. Great show. I would love to do a part two if uh, if you guys are down. Yeah, we do a mythicism one. Yeah, I've, I've, no, I haven't gotten a good debate on mythicism. I've been down to debate carrier. John won't do it. Uh, Gleason won't do it. I'm down. I mean, now let's do it. Yeah. And so, uh, last be happy one. To. Yeah. Excellent. Last one here from uh, the Blackfish. Uh, Ten Canadian dollars. Sometimes in my most wild fantasies, I wonder if the Bible and Jesus was just a fan fiction that got out and then people took it seriously. Romans were afraid of the Abrahamic God, uh, God's followers, too. Although some Romans were also interested in judaism right neil like they wanted to that was, that was one of the points i forgot to mention today i wanted to bring up i was talking to a lot of i talked to a lot of classes about this like Karl ruck says greco-romans in general latins and greeks they love eastern shit they are fascinated by the exotic religions of the east persian zoroastrianism yeah. judaism egyptian stuff they love it it's like the way people in america love hinduism and buddhism and they pretend to be like all hip and like oh i'm a hindu now that's how they were in Rome. They lo they they just thought the other is interesting. They're used to all. They the thought it is like they thought it is foreign and old. Yes, exactly. They thought it was older, right? Which is not, but they thought it was. It's funny because Jupiter's way older by by like ten thousand, like way older than Yahweh by like five thousand years. He's older, maybe even more than that. Jupiter predates writing. He's a proto Indo European god. He's so old you can't. Even, nobody even knows how old he is. Yahweh shows up in like seven or like you know thousand BC, something like that. But like seriously though, that's it's just funny. They thought he they're right. They thought they think it's older and more exotic. That's what it is. Hmm. Interesting. All right. So I think that that pretty much concludes this uh, wonderful stream. I'm really happy that uh, Adam, you got to come on today, and Neil, I always love having you. And we definitely got to continue this conversation. I saw somebody who I'm not going to uh, name over here wrote a message but then uh deleted it saying like oh it's a straw man that love is saying about how you know nobody's saying it's like all of them but again just to emphasize here i don't want to dwell on it too much but that's kind of like the point that i'm saying it's people say well it's not all of them my point is that there are so many that you wouldn't believe that have absolutely zero to do with what you're talking about here but because you're getting all of your news from a lot of left coastal elite type newspapers and publications who do you expect you're going to hear from the most when it comes to that stuff i know that's not the religious stuff but again when it comes to the environment we're in right now i think there is a lot of confusion and it's needless but anyway guys any final thoughts before we go anything you want to plug more anything of that nature uh adam let's start with you Sure. I really appreciate you, Lev, for setting this up. Uh, I was hoping that you would ask me one day. So finally, my dream came true. Neil, again, I've wanted to talk to you for a long time. We, we DM'd a few years ago, and uh, I called into one stream before, too, and we did a little impromptu talk about this. But I enjoyed it. I thought it was cool. 
and I uh, hope to do a mythicism one one time. Uh, there's one last thing on my in, in my head that I wanted to cover today without time, and that's the life of Jesus story, the total mm. fieshu. And they actually believe it, this is the rabbinical, like secret view of how Christianity started. That it started as a heretical sect in Judaism, and they saw it as a threat. So Peter and Paul took it away and took it to the Gentiles and took it to Rome and changed it to make it more pagan. So um, uh, adherence to Judaism would be like uh, adverted to it. They would stay away from it. By the way, it's interesting that interesting that they have that theory that like they started it and took it to Rome. It kind of aligns with sure. you know, the, the topic of the debate. Uh, there's also a Talmudic fragment about Jesus's father being Pantera, a Roman soldier. Mm. And Mary was a prostitute who they have like some phrases in there that she used to do her hair like, like a prostitute. Mm. And she got pregnant with a Roman soldier named Pantera. I actually think this is true. Not because isn't that dated? That's dated to like 200 BC, right? The time of like a Greek, uh, not a text. Greek king. The text that dates him to 500, 200 BC is the one about his crucifixion. By the way, oddly, the one about I his crucifixion. was the Pandaric because there's Pantera Jesus one, Ben Stada and Jesus Pan, uh, Jesus Pantera. And the Stada, I, I think that, Stada one where it says that he was mm -hmm. hung on Passover Eve for leading Israel astray, and uh, uh, that talks about that one. That one does have a weird passage about under the time of uh uh what's his name shit i can't remember the guy's name but you're right it, it dates to like 100 bc or something um but anyways the 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 pantera one though the reason why i think this might be true is because number one there's no mention of joseph anywhere in paul so paul is the earliest then the first gospel mark doesn't mention joseph once the first time joseph gets mentioned is like the 90s when matthew gets written and they're just throwing up the, so the pantera theory is actually mentioned by Celsus in the second in the early second century and he says he heard it from the jews that jesus had a father who was a, a roman soldier so Celsus is saying this in the like 120s 130s he's saying that so it's almost contemporary with joseph well, guys, I believe that that is it. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate you guys being here. The chat, shout out to all the people in the chat, including Gooner Goon, Gabriel Oak, who says Pantera are amazing, referring to the band. Uh, I definitely have to check them out. Uh, Joshua Carpenter, uh, Afrung's Visioner, Marta, James Diamond, the Aquarian TV, who says it's not the left or the right. It's hmm. Anyway, uh, we have a Discord, like I said before, because I have a good feeling that a lot of the people who are watching this, I, I don't know, I think that you guys are big Discord heads. I could be wrong about that, but I really bet that that's the situation. So I'm going to uh, link the uh, Discord for you guys here, the official BTR Discord. Go in there right now, and patrons also have access to a Patreon-only section of the Discord where we discuss a lot of uh, interesting stuff. And uh, here we go. This is the Discord link. And, of course, patreon.com slash break the rules. Here is the link to that. Become a patron today. And lastly, landofbiltong.com. I'm posting this link in here as well. BTR is the code. Press in. Get free shipping on your biltong. It's extremely delicious South African uh, jerky. You're not going to regret getting that. Where could we find you, Adam Green and Neil? Same thing. And then I'm going to sign off. No more news on Rumble and Odyssey is where I stream. <clears throat> and I'm on Twitter at no underscore more underscore news. Is that a play on words like no more news as in the news is over? Yeah, or like knowledge, knowing more news or oh, having like re or rejecting the news, like no more news. And it mm. started because like my first videos were like just lots of clips of news, basically. We both have a uh, play on not knowledge or gnosis in our titles. Mine's Gnostic Informant. But uh, yeah, Gnostic Informant on YouTube. That's pretty much the main place. Or, or follow me on Twitter. I, I've started to get more a little more active on there. I'm, I can't stand Twitter. It makes me sick. I literally, <laughs> when I go on Twitter or X, I get like nauseous reading all this shit that people are saying. It's like, I can't do it. And you know what's even worse than that is TikTok. I can't even be on TikTok for five. I get sick. I get like physically sick from watching some people say some crazy dumb shit. I can't stand it. Yeah. I'd rather be outside reading a book. Look at this guy, by the way. Watch what you say on Discord, friends. 
I really just feel like there's so much energy that's trapped in people right now. You know, whenever they would go out in public and say the word of power, all of a sudden, they're like, they get giddy like a bunch of schoolgirls. I've seen it myself at, like, some of these events. You know, I, I think a lot of people just need friends to hang out with at the end of the day and, like, good people. And that's why, like, I really appreciate the conversations we have here. Because, like, I actually get to meet a lot of uh, the people on BTR and talk with them and go to events and stuff like that. And, uh... Yeah, I really appreciate that. So anyway, guys, you could follow me at LevePo on uh, Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it. And uh, yeah, that's it. Subscribe, hit the bell, hit the like button. The like button is extremely important for the uh, growth of the algorithm. I cannot stress enough how important like a lot of this stuff is because it only takes you a second to press that like button. And that's it. By doing that, you have helped this channel out so much. BTR, bringing all the people together from all these different circles. That's what happens here, and let's let's pre let's spread this out. Let's spread the love. Anyway, uh, thank you guys so much. Adam Green, thank you. Neil, thank you. I will see you guys next.